Hello and welcome to our live feed, wherever you are in the world, whatever time zone you're in. Lots of chat ahead about Formula One, specifically, of course, the opening round of the 2024 FIA World Championship in Bahrain. Won again by Red Bull. One, two. Is that boring or do we think that's brilliant? Are we acclaiming the stunning success of this team? What do we think? Ugh, the season's over already. Interested to get your views on that one. Uh, I've got mine, I think. I'm not quite sure what I think at the moment. I'm a bit, I'm a bit sort of bedazzled by the whole, uh, the whole thing. Um, because, yeah, I was expecting a little bit more, I think. A little bit more from the opposition. And it was a bit of a walkover, wasn't it? Total walkover, actually. Uh, to see Max out there at the end on his new set of red soft tires. I know the others didn't have new new sets of tires to put on at the end which is probably why they wimped out and stayed on the hard tires but um just to see him out there doing that and putting that lap time in from the pole leading from start to finish i mean talk about a walkover unbelievable victory for max verstappen so uh yeah i don't know what what else one can say about it really um but i'm interested to get your views definitely and that's what we'll be doing today for sure looking forward to that today or tonight wherever you are as i say um i've been phoning around as much as I can since Bahrain, various engineer friends in various teams to see what they think might have happened on Charles Leclerc's Ferrari. Very strange, the whole thing. I mean, obviously, he did have a brake temperature imbalance at the front. There's no doubt about that and the locking up and everything else. But it was kind of a strange race for him, wasn't it? Excuse me, I've got something in my eye. I think it's suntan lotion. It's really itchy suddenly in my right eye, probably left to you. Yeah, I think it's got it got suntan lotion in See, the trouble these sunny days in Spain you cover yourself in suntan and sunscreen anyway <laughs> getting back to the point um he was fastest hard runner on the track in his last stint so it was a, it was a very weird thing I mean he, obviously the flat spotted tires had a lot to do with what was going on at Ferrari but they did have an issue which was there and which he had to live with and he drove around really well I think he drove around that problem classic Charles Leclerc but what was the issue? I mean, it's very, very strange. The um, they did actually change before the race on the on the Saturday night. They did actually change the and I'll get it right. The left hand side front brake duct exit deflector. Now that could have been an arrow thing. It could have been that they'd got a sort of abnormal temperature, maybe, uh, and that was something that they thought was a potential belt and braces. Let's just change that. But it's not unusual to see things like that being changed. I mean, on Lewis's Hamilton's car, Lewis Hamilton's car, on the uh, on the Friday night, they changed the right uh, right front inner brake drum and the left rear brake drum as well, left rear brake drum. So that's even more fundamental in terms of brake stuff. I mean, the thing to say about about Charles' problem, I think, is that brakes and I mean brakes we take pretty much for granted now. They're pretty good. I mean, they the possibility of glazing uh, glazing the brakes glazing the pads very very small the drivers are into their routine they know what to do even if they didn't have the sensors on the sort of formation lap they would still be able to get around it pretty well I think so I don't think we can say the brakes were glazed I mean if they were I'll be completely astounded so it's got to be something like debris in the in the duct I would imagine and that's that's a difficult thing, you know. You can't. It's not like the old days when you can put your hand in the front brake duct and grab the the tennis ball out or whatever it is that's inside. I mean, we're talking about unbelievably intricate bits of Formula One carbon design. In, in fact, just going off on a tangent now. I've been going off on a tangent really from the start, but just going on a further tangent, a tributary. The the complexity of particularly the front brake ducts, if that's the right word drums whatever you want to call them are such that you've got to think why haven't they legislated against so they've made everything else on the car as simple as they can more or less and they've got this unbelievably intricate thing which you know i know some teams have sensors on the on the ducts so that if they get more than two or three particles of rubber on the on the sort of aerodynamic element on the edge they can tell exactly where it is. So when they come in on the pit stop, they can just remove those little particles of rubber. That's how much effect they have on the arrow flow. And that's getting to be so, well, I don't know. I was going to say ridiculous, but I better not say that because I, in a way it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? That this, these details count so much. 
So I don't know, you know, maybe it's a bit of rubber, a bit of something got into the brakes on, on, on the Charles car and the temperatures went up and he then had to manage them. Uh, but, you know, reading through the Ferrari stuff afterwards, Freddie Vasseur is fairly sort of matter of fact about it. And he's he's concerned more actually about the car wasn't quicker overall and they had they had other issues and the handling went off and you know it's I just I will I'm wait and see with great interest what Brembo come up with when they really if they ever give us any details on what really happened there but at some point in the year we'll find out exactly what happened and I think for sure when the dust has settled a bit so that was a weird thing and then there was the other thing which was the Lewis uh, Lewis deal which I mean apart from like the two Williams drivers and George, Lewis had to live with overheating, which was very strange. I, we didn't hear any reports of that from McLaren, the other Mercedes team. For both factory Mercedes and Williams, customer Mercedes, to have overheating issues is, I don't know, what does it suggest? That they went to a different map, maybe, and nothing showed up in practice and qualifying. Um, there were, there were other issues on the Williams, enough to make Alex Albon say, this is what happens when you only have three days of testing. This, what happened today, would have shown up on, on, in testing. But at Mercedes, it was just like, wow, what's happened to our temperatures here? And, and they were at a complete loss to understand. And, and then it became a vicious circle of, of, of coasting, keeping the engine temperatures down. And as a result of that, as the night got cooler, and it was quite cool, you know, there were people there in sort of, you know, um, sleeveless uh, hunting jacket type things, Christian Horner type stuff. <laughs> Can we allowed to say that when he's in his point to point mode, uh, British point to point, for those who don't know what a point to point is, it's a, uh, it's a sort of amateur horse race meeting in the middle of a wet, soggy farmer's field in the middle of nowhere where very nice racehorses jump over hedges and stuff and it's quite dangerous for the horses actually there's a lot of feeling against it but for, for the set that love it and I think Christian's family does particularly his wife it got, they love their horses I mean Christian is in the sort of the whole English attire for that anyway getting back to the point there are a lot of people wearing these sort of gilet jackets around it was quite cold in other words and so you the, the tire temperatures were going away from the Mercs fairly consistently and that became a sort of vicious cycle of downward trending um but i don't know you know it's it's amazing isn't it that they if it is an ecu or if it's a, a sort of engine mapping thing it's amazing they got it so wrong and everybody else managed to get it more or less right a and b lewis then had this weird thing with the seat which isn't mentioned at all this gives i mean not that it's relevant really to the to you fans out there but it wasn't mentioned at all in the mercedes report post-race Excuse me. Now, what does that tell you? Does that tell you that because it was a Lewis issue, they're not really, they don't consider it to be that important? I don't know. Or do they, or do they think, oh, this is so embarrassing, we may not mention it. I mean, this is, what, this is one of my gripes about Formula One, that the technology, and when the technology goes wrong, it's just as interesting as when it goes right. That's an important point. The technology is absolutely part of what Formula One is all about. And I don't know why the teams just sort of glibly step over things as if they never happened. And there's Lewis talking about talking about the seat of feeling as if it's broken going as he breaks into turn one, which is quite a big deal. It doesn't happen very often in Formula One. And it certainly would affect the way a driver feels and the feeling he's getting from the car. I mean, amazing that Lewis drove the race he did, really, with that. And, but no mention of it in the Mercedes post-race report, press release, nothing. Just astonishing. Um, and as far as that seat goes, I've been thinking about that. I mean, a carbon seat, it's almost impossible to think of something like that breaking. And I'm sure, although they said the seat broke, I don't think, I can't imagine that's what happened. I, would, I think it's much more likely that one of the little um, lugs or pegs on which the seat is mounted in the carbon chassis broke under braking and, and, and Lewis probably felt the seat just sort of move like that when that lug broke. I think they have four or six of them or something like that under the seat. That's probably what broke. I can't imagine that the seat itself broke is what some people are saying. I mean it's just almost beyond belief that a carbon seat could break these days. But anyway, um, that I think that's what happened and Lewis to his credit did a really good job in that in that sense I think. But very you know there's a lot of sort of discussion afterwards all these teams saying oh you know we got this wrong we got that wrong but i mean in a way that detracted from how well red bull did and how right they got it 
most of the time. The, the only time I saw Max in any sort of trouble was when he had already set fastest lap and he was just pulling away from Sergio. And then for about five laps, he just obviously went into, into lift and coast mode and just got all the temperatures down again and was everything was very cool. And he was losing about 0.6, I guess, a lap to Sergio at that point, Perez, and, and but not losing anything to anybody else, to, to Carlos or anyone. Um, but to go back to, to where we started, which was which was Charles Leclerc and that that brake problem, he he did set the fastest lap on the hard tyres in that last stint. He was like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 quicker than. Let's have a look. Actually, Charles Leclerc did 34.0, Carlos Sainz 34.5. So and that was on the last stint on the hard tyres. So it's half a second quicker than Carlos with that brake issue. And George Russell 35.0. Um, as well, his fastest lap again on that last stint, but the tyres losing grip like crazy, and and of course, as we saw, as bad as supposedly the brakes were on the Charles car, that's where he actually managed to pass George uh, at turn ten. I've often talked about that nine turn ten. I've talked about that nauseam really, so I won't go on about it. But it was it was significant, if nothing else, that if you've got a brake issue, that is of course where it's going to show up the most because you're braking. A, under load, but I think a lot of the reason Charles was able to get better and better as the race went on is because he is so good through there and he was probably leaving even more width going through nine, the quick kink, just to give himself a really good braking area into 10. And that paid off with that move on George. Um, so maybe next year he'll stick to that line. Not that he wasn't near it anyway. I mean, he's very, very good through there. Very good. So we'll get your get your comments on everything. And what else did I want to say? I thought Oscar drove pretty well. I thought Lando drove well. Um, yeah, Lance Stroll came up through the field. I suppose got to give him a mention. Fernando disappointing. I thought they, I mean, they did extend the stint and they did try to, you know, give him a bit of a run right at the end. But I don't understand. I don't really understand why they didn't do it at Mercedes either, why they didn't put him on the soft tyre in the last stint. I know they didn't have new sets, but then nor did they at, at Haas Ferrari when they put Nico Hulkenberg on used new set and used, used softs, and he did pretty well on them. He didn't, you know, he picked up some time and looked good on them. So I don't understand why out of those four cars, at least one of them didn't even try putting softs on, particularly at Mercedes where they were losing temperature so much out of the hard tyre. And if, if you're going to extend the stint as much as you did with Fernando, why not put him on the softs anyway? I know they were used softs, but it's still, I think, um, I think personally it would have been worth worth a shot. Anyway, I've said all that now. Let's, um, let's have a look at some of your questions. The first one is from Lee Kambanga. Hi, Lee. Evening to you. Evening in Spain, that is. Not quite sure where you are. Hi, Peter. I think you're not biased like what the other person said. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, well, I don't know who the, what the other person did say, so I can't really. Um, I'm a bit, I'm a bit sad about that. I'd like people to think I'm biased. I mean, wh why wouldn't you be biased? How can you be a, a motor racing enthusiast if you don't have your people that you like and people that you're not so keen on and teams you like and team you don't? I mean, I mean, I learned all that. I mean, obviously, if if you're in the business of journalism and and reporting, in theory, you've got to be completely objective, but. Um, but as Dennis Jenkinson, who was the greatest of all motor racing journalists, and if you those those who don't know, sadly he's not with us anymore. But he used to write these incredibly long and detailed reports in Motorsport magazine, and wrote several excellent books as well. And he was very very opinionated. And one I remember when I was pushing Nigel Mansell as much as I could back in the in the eighties. Uh, and I remember I, I went up to Jenks at one point and said, Jenks, you know, you weren't very kind to Nigel there. And he said, oh, well, I don't like him or something like that. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a bit biased, isn't it? And he said, yeah, that's what, you know, all good journalists are biased. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, I've learned something today. Anyway, that was about the bias thing. Um, I used to think the same when Mercedes were dominating because you were always talking about how good they are all the time. But there's a big but here. Um, let's have a look. Uh, but. I came to realize that you are just expressing how good a team or a driver is. For example, now with Max and Red Bull. Good work. I also think Carlos is a better race driver than Leclerc. Ferrari were holding Carlos back with strategy or telling him not to attack Charles a lot in his time at Ferrari. I think this season we will see the best of him. Ferrari don't sabotage him. Sabotage him. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, didn't he drive well, Carlos Sainz? I think he drove really well. And he's had his ups and downs. 
I mean, I still think he got ripped off like crazy at the Australian Grand Prix last year. I mean, that was just ridiculous after the restart and how he got that penalty. But in general, I think he's he's driving really well. He's driven driving well all the time, and he's got a completely new um, carrot ahead of him now, which is to get the best possible launching pad for the rest of his career post Ferrari, and and that. That's what he looked like on Saturday in Bahrain, did he not? He just looked really good. And he was didn't make mistakes. He was quick. He was aggressive. And from his point of view, you know, he beat Charles Leclerc. Whether or not, of course, you know, they'll factor in the whole brake issue and everything else is another matter. But in terms of having to race Charles pretty hard to get him and then pulling away and finishing P3, very good drive. Will Ferrari... I don't think Ferrari will... Um, sabotage him at all i don't think they'll even favor charles uh, really i think they'll be i think they'll be feeling a little bit sad that he's that they've had to come to this decision i think i'm sure he's really popular in the team and the, and the factory and he'll be getting exactly the same equipment as charles if there's any one of something some mega new front flap <laughs> i don't know what it'll be these days i don't know what you can have mega on the car some new new thing and there's only one, yeah, probably it'll go to Charles. But, you know, there's, right now, Carlos is head in the World Championship. So, you know, why wouldn't they give it to him for the next race, which is this Saturday? I mean, that's, this is a debrief from Bahrain, but I mean, Saudi Arabia this weekend. L.A. Flame. L.A. Flame, great name. Thoughts on Lewis versus George this season? And do you think if Mercedes understands this concept more, they can upgrade it faster than the other teams to show that they still have what it takes? Well, in theory, yes, they can upgrade faster and develop the car better and and continue to build on what we saw in Bahrain qualifying, <laughs> not necessarily the race. Uh, reliability is not something you, you, uh, you assume is going to be an issue at a team like Mercedes these days. And yet their overheating issues does have to come under the heading of do have to come under the heading of, of unreliability. And that, that was a shock, really. A shock to them and I think a shock to everybody who was watching it. Um, Lewis versus George. Yeah, Lewis laid back. Pretty comfortable with life now that he's got his future sorted. He'll take what's there, not get too uptight if it doesn't work out, and try to enjoy his racing. And I think will drive very well as a result. We saw that on Thursday in Bahrain. Very strangely, his weekend sort of went downhill from there. Friday, Saturday, qualifying particularly not not good. I mean, he didn't he didn't look bad. Uh, he just the, the the grip level and balance went away. And and after qualifying, don't forget, he said, "Well, you know, George went in one direction, try and get one performance lap out of the car. I've got a more consistent car with fuel in it, but." You know, did that show up in the race? Okay, there were a lot of things he had to deal with. The the overheating, the seat. Maybe that coloured any verdict we can give about the setup he had in the car. But it didn't look like George had a lot of issues with, uh, with, with the setup he had. His main issue was just keeping the temperatures down. So, but again, you know, they were driving inside this envelope of trying to keep the tyres managed. And so you can't really make a comment about that. I mean, the qualifying was interesting, wasn't it? Because Charles Leclerc was actually quickest on his Q2 lap. He's quicker in Q2 than he was in Q3. And Lewis's performance went off as well in Q3. But nobody else's did. Everybody else went quicker in Q3. So my, my assumption from that, that's only an assumption, is that the, temperature, the ambient temperatures were coming down a little bit. And I think the balance changed on the car's on those relevant cars but then and but they didn't on the Carlos science car you could argue but then again maybe he wasn't at the limit in q2 so um maybe that's what it was and in which case they're right on the edge aren't they of a, of a performance balance envelope which would suggest that it's going to be quite difficult for them to get somewhere near red bull's huge performance envelope because red bull can live with uh, changing ambience, changing wind direction, changing crosswind severity, track surface changes. You know, Red Bull's got this lovely big sweet spot around which they can operate, in which they can operate. Whereas it looks like Mercedes and Ferrari on that basis are right on the edge of what they can do, which is an old story from 2023, isn't it? So, you know, it's... Uh, I, I think George... 
I mean, it, there are a few rumors out there, aren't there? And I'm not a rumor person, as you know. I just sort of wait and see what happens when it comes to personalities and scandal. But there is, I've got to say, there is a talk, obviously, that, you know, maybe there's going to be a mass drama at Red Bull and maybe Max and his dad are going to be leaving and, and Toto's sniffing around trying to see if he can get Max into a Mercedes for 2025 on a long-term contract, I presume. In which case he would then um, get rid of George and run the great Kimi. <laughs> That's a big, big story if it happens. I doubt it. I doubt... I mean, the racer inside me and I think inside Max tells me that if it came down to racing with Adrian Newey or going with his dad because his dad was in disgrace, I think he'd stay with Adrian Newey. But I may be wrong. I may be misreading Max and maybe I don't know him well enough. I know he's very loyal to his dad and close to his dad, but equally, why wouldn't he stay with Adrian if he was if Adrian was staying at Red Bull, of course? Could be that Adrian might go as well to Mercedes. What if that happened? Um, anyway, the next question kind of is along those lines. What is happening with Red Bull? I think that's probably what you're referring to. I mean, what we know is happening to Red Bull on the track is not much at all other than what we expect and what we've seen, you know, just total domination. But in terms of people and what's going on, I don't know, you know, it's all... If Joss is involved, there's another question here from Esperanza. If I think Joss should know his place. It's not a good thing that he's involved. It won't end well. You know, it's incredibly... Um, I find it absolutely astonishing that, if any of this is true, that Max would have, and can I use this word, allowed his father to do anything to jeopardise his world championship uh, challenge <laughs> at Red Bull. How, how wouldn't, I mean, for sure, Max is in a position to say, look, stop this. I mean, I knew, I knew, I knew Joss pretty well and kind of still do before he was for Max's in Formula One. And he was quite pushy and quite, you know, talkative. But the minute Max got into Formula One, first with Toro Rosso, then with Red Bull, he sort of clammed up and he's, he's just in the garage saying nothing, expressionless almost, being the dutiful father who knows his place and doesn't want to get involved other than just to be there enjoying watching his son drive. And that's the role he's always played. So you've always assumed that that's how he lives his life in support of Max. But if he's been involved in stuff that has brought about a major drama at Red Bull, and it's a big if there, and I'm not in any way saying that he has, um, it's, it's almost incomprehensible how that could have been allowed to have happened. That's all I can say, really, because, as I say, it's, I mean, I know a lot of, I imagine a lot of journalists out there, and I imagine a lot of news um, channels are all trying to get the scoop on this. I'm not in any way... Um, that sort of journalist. I, I'm much more interested in brake temperatures on the Ferrari. <laughs> okay, uh, Roderick Buda wins. Hi, Pete. Should Daniel have given the place back to Yuki? I think he should have, actually. I think he should have. It's a good question because, um, you know, Daniel was on newer tyres and oh, he was on new softs, wasn't he? And yeah, and Yuki let him past and he didn't actually do anything with it. So normally in that, that circumstance, he gives the place back. But Daniel said afterwards, oh, it is what it is. And we talked about it before the race. And blah, blah, blah. I don't know. That won't have sat that well with Yuki Sonoda, I don't think. So it'll be interesting to see how those two match up around the triple DRS Saudi Arabian drag strip. Yeah, I've always said that to me that that pairing is going to be one of the most interesting. And I said this long before the season started. One of the most interesting of 2024, Daniel Ricciardo versus Yoki Sonoda. Daniel Ricciardo, the old pro who would love to be back at Red Bull again in support of Max, uh, racing with Max. Um, and Yuki Sonoda, the baby-faced young pretender who's actually much quicker than most people think including Daniel, probably. So, yeah, that's going to be... It is already. It's an interesting matchup, isn't it? Aaron Lee. Good evening from Sydney, Peter. G'day, Aaron. I hope it's not too late for you guys now. It probably is by the time I got going here. Um, what do you think of Lewis's complaint of the forward seating position of last year's car, considering it's only a few millimetres difference? It is something... Is it something he ought to have adjusted to, considering cars have had more extreme seating positions in the past? Front engine cars, the cars 17 and 80. Not that he drove them, but others were able to. Um, you know what, Aaron? I made exactly the same point the other day to Rob Wilson. I was chatting to him. I said, I, I, said, I can't believe Lewis 
really did find the driving position on last year's Merck to be too forward biased. And he, as he never looked at any pictures of Alan Prost and René Arnoux and Renault Turbos. And, and Rob said, oh, well, you know, it's different back then. Uh, Rob was very much on Lewis's side, actually. And I said, well, I don't know. I, I've never known a race driver in not being able to adapt. I, but then I remembered the reality of it all is that if it's a quick car, and you're winning races, you'll drive anything. And it's incredible how well balanced the car is and how comfortable the driving position is. But if it's a dog of a car, with all respect to Dexter here, um, if it's a dog of a car and the forward driving position is something that you haven't experienced before, you might put two and two together and get five. So I think that's what it's all about. I think the Mercedes was not a very good car last year, and that was one of the things that annoyed Lewis. So, but as I say, if it had been a great car, if it had been as good as an RB19, I think um, he'd be saying how great the forward driving position is. I want, wanted more, even more forward. Um, so I think that's it, Aaron, to be honest. And so it's the same with beauty, isn't it? It's amazing how winning cars always look quite beautiful, regardless of how ugly they are. And how quickly a shape fades when it looks wonderful under lights, but it's at the back of the grid. Let's think of some good examples of that, actually. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the Tyrrell, the 1973 Tyrrell was a very short wheelbase, sort of stubby car. You wouldn't have said, you know, alongside a Dan Gurney Eagle that it was the most beautiful Grand Prix car ever built. And yet, when Jackie Stewart's walking away with, you know, the British Grand Prix or the German Grand Prix completely at one in the car, it just was suddenly it was the most beautiful Grand Prix car of all time. Um, and then I think let's think of the opposite uh, of a very beautiful, well, the Parnelli. Maurice Philippe's Parnelli was a beautiful car, but it was never very good. Even Mario couldn't get it to really go well. And so all of a sudden it became a little bit ugly. No, it wasn't ugly, but it was just not, it just didn't look as beautiful as it did under lights, if you see what I mean. Okay, Looks, uh, Lucas Knox here. Hey, Peter, what are your thoughts on Kimi Antonelli's first Formula 2 weekend? I feel like current journalism is leading, leaning way too much into drama and sensationalism. Everything needs to be a story. Well, I don't know what story there was around him. All I know is that everybody raves about him. And so I go in the other direction, as I've said many times. I've got nothing against him at all. I'm just not very good in crowds. So I tend not to go with the, where the trending hash is. I tend to go in the opposite place. But looking at it and watching the races, I thought he drove very well, actually. I mean, if, if Oliver Berman is your yardstick, which he has to be because he's in the other Prima car, he outqualified him by a tenth and then he outraced him in the sprint and in the feature race he actually got in, up to p10 so he did you know next to oliver behrman he did a very good job it was obviously a terrible weekend for prema in formula two so when you know that's it doesn't matter i mean all you gotta do is relate to what he's doing to oliver behrman and he looked i have to say he looked pretty good whether he looked better than a lot of the other guys out there is another question of course i mean zane maloney was wow i mean where's this this guy's just unbelievable isn't he and um I was super impressed with Zane. I thought he drove incredibly well. And to win both the sprint and the feature is a big deal. I mean, it's been done before, obviously, but it's a big deal to do that. And um, congratulations to him for that. As a, as a matter of fact, just on this F2, in case I'll do it now because nobody's ever really, because we don't know what's going to happen here. But Zane Maloney comes from Barbados. And would you believe his, um, his dad. dad owns this track in Barbados? Bushy Park, it's called, and karting. Lewis has been there with an F1 Merc doing burnouts at some point, doing stuff, and and, and that's where that's where Zane grew up. And his brother Callum is doing unbelievably well in karting as well, still in Barbados. But Zane did really well and came over, and he's just unbelievably quick, isn't he? Here he is in his karting days. Mega, good luck to him. He 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 obviously drives. Well, he does. He drives beautifully. And um, he drives for, for Carlin as well. I say Carlin. It's now called Roden. And I've known Trevor for a long time. It's very sad he's no longer involved with that team. There are a lot of stuff that's... That there is a lot of stuff that's gone on in the background and uh, none of which... You know, it's all quite personal, so I'm not going to go into all that stuff. But I would just wish Trevor well because he's put a... He's got a huge uh, imprint on a lot of young drivers and motorsport in general. And I hope he's, you know, does well in the future plans, what he's going to do. But the team now is without Trevor and it's called Rodin now, the new owners. And that's the team that Zane Maloney drives for when he blitzed the 4-1-2. Unbelievable. Um, 
commiserations to Kush Maini, who's the younger brother of uh, Arjun Maini, Maini, who you may remember was pretty quick in Formula 3 and Formula 2. And Kush, I've met him a couple of times actually uh, in that simulator place up at Silverstone with my mate Matt Cowley, and uh, who's very quick as well but and racing GT cars and stuff. And Kush, Kush has been there a lot too. And good to see him going well. I mean, he was on the pole, but didn't then got disqualified for some technical thing that wouldn't have made much difference to the car. I think it was one millimeter or something on one deflector or something like that. So that he had to start from the back, but he actually worked his way up to seventh, would you believe, from 22nd on in the feature race. So Kush man, he did really well. And while I'm at it, Formula 3, um, Arvid Lindblad, Red Bull driver, uh, Prema, very quick, won the won the sprint race, looked really quick. And then, got to say, Browning, unbelievable, is really good in the Luke Browning, who won the Macau Grand Prix and uh, driving for high tech. He's managed by Ollie Oaks, who owns high tech. And here he is, he won the sprint, the feature race, Formula 3. Very, very good as well. So, yeah, lots going on. Um, and I think um, Antonelli did pretty well. I mean, obviously, because he wasn't in the results, a lot of people might be saying, oh, what's all the fuss about? But um, I thought if you compare him with the way Oliver drove or the problems Oliver had, I think obviously in his first weekend, a difficult car, he did very well. Lucas Noxio again. Um, the amount of attention simp simple comments get, even if their source says the actual opposite later when it, on when it clarifies. Things are like the current Max to Merck in 25 are just beyond idiotic. Well, they may be beyond idiot idiotic. The, 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 um, as I say, the, the main thrust of the idea there is that, I don't know whether these are coming from Toto or what, but um, the thrust of the idea is that, that Joss is in trouble and that Joss may be obliged to sort of leave the team, not that he's in the team anyway. But as I say, it's a big, big ask to think that Max would then leave Red Bull as well. I just can't see that he would. Um, so there we go. Um, Fernando Matias. Hello, Peter. What about science? Looking good so far. Should he really go the Audi way or punch higher stakes? Sauber is no Braun Grand Prix and I can't see Audi becoming the next Mercedes. No, no. I think I made this point last time. I think obviously if he gets a straight offer from Mercedes with a multi-year contract, he would take it and should take it. But I don't think he will. I think he'll get a relatively short-term contract offer at Mercedes because of their you know, desire to want to run Antonelli. And and I think it'll be the same at Red Bull. They might offer him something long-term at Red Bull instead of Perez, but Perez did pretty well, didn't he? He played his role pretty well. And again, you'd have to come up with the argument of why Sainz would be a better number two for Max than than Perez. And looking at it all from Sainz's point of view, if he goes to Mercedes, he's, e he's either going to have, well, he's going to have George in the car or in the other car, or if all these rumours are to be, be believed, Max in the other car. And if he goes to Red Bull, he's got Max. So um, that's why I say, from the point of view of longevity in his career in Formula One and growing with a team that obviously will need to grow, big time um, but nonetheless there is a big regulation change in 26 and, and things may change the balance may change and Audi may do a really good job with this 50% electrification Formula One engine power unit and so that may not be a bad place for him to be I mean on the face of it you'd say oh well you know obviously Mercedes is a quicker car but long term and giving Carlos the peace of mind and everything else that comes from knowing you're in Formula One for the next five years, you're growing with this big manufacturer and it's going to get bigger and better all the time. It's not a bad move for him to go there, I think, if that really is on the table. I've said that before and that's what I, you know, I stand by that really. Um, so that's that one. Let's have a look. Um, I was trying to get to this next one, actually. This whole scrolling thing seems to have frozen again. So that's a bit of an issue. Uh, it's getting back to the top now. Excuse me while I scroll, scroll, scroll. Okay. Um, Robin Visser, Adrian and Max for one billion to Mercedes. Well, I've said that Ferrari should have signed Adrian for one billion four years ago, five years ago, I think I said, and by which time they would have won at least two world championships, if not more, and got all their money back. You're saying one billion to be split between between Adrian and Max? Hmm. 
half a, half a billion each? No, nah, not enough, not enough. <laughs> I'm kind of joking, but yeah, if Max, if, I don't know, if all this is true, would Adrian follow and go to Mercedes? He might, yeah, it's just up the road, isn't it? So it doesn't, it's not, not as, as if he's got to start, you know, up, up moving house and going up sticks to Italy or whatever. So it might be better. Um, Oliver Cadman, ban Mumbai Eastwood from chat. Oh, okay. Well, I haven't actually got any from Mumbai Eastwood, but um, thank you for that, Oliver. Jack Mundo, can the FIA do anything to make it competitive again? Terribly boring these days. <laughs> well, in the old days, Bernie would just sort of help a couple of the teams he liked along with, um, I've got my tongue in my cheek at the moment. I'm not saying this seriously. Uh, with a few things going on with the way scales or whatever and we'd get we'd suddenly and in the really old days pre-Bernie Ferrari would magically have a lot more power at Monza but you know everybody talks so much about visibility and everything being strict as whatever can make it that I doubt anyone will do anything I agree with you you know it's they need to be in a position maybe to try and change things around a bit but how are they going to do that I mean Having said all of that, you know, and I said this in the last live stream, don't forget, it wasn't that long ago that Formula One was the subject of probably the greatest miscarriage of sporting justice we've seen maybe ever, certainly in the last 30 years. And I'm talking about Abu Dhabi 21, and that was all at the feet of, uh, of the FIA. So if they're capable of doing what they did at Abu Dhabi 21, I guess they're quite capable of doing similar things again. Uh, and that might well affect <coughs> you know other teams Red Bull um, so yeah I mean I, I just finishing on that point I, I you know I think because so many people are, are invested in the sport they we haven't had anything like enough criticism or, or anything like enough background to what happened in Abu Dhabi 21 and I think Mercedes gave up on that much too soon in, in terms of really taking that as far as they could go. And I know Toto said recently, oh, well, Lewis wanted to drop it all. But did he? I mean, was, was, would he have said, come that on his own or was it talking to a lot of people at Mercedes saying, oh, you know, maybe we better not make too big a deal of this. You know, let's move on, move on, move on. The usual old cliche. In which point I can imagine Lewis might have said, well, yeah, OK, I guess you're right. But I, I think that was a wrong decision. I think, you know, that was such such an outrageous breach of the technique of the sporting regulations that that should have been taken much further and it's you know it's not the last time we've had races decided several weeks after the thing what about that Brazilian Grand Prix that Giancarlo Fisichella won at Imola <laughs> you know after Kimi Raikkonen being on the podium and had the trophy for two weeks uh, the winner eventually was found to be because they did the recount of the results before the the big was it Alonso shunt, I think, or was it Weber? Both of them. Um, big shunt. Um, that they gave the win to Giancarlo. So they could have done the same. They should have treated it as a race. Instead of which, it was the championship, you know, and, and that's why nobody did anything. Completely wrong. It should not have been isolated. And I still, I feel very strongly about that, that I don't think enough people have spoken out about it, even today. Um... John Valin Bailey says, unfortunately, Formula 2 and Formula 3 are more exciting now. Well, yeah, guess why? All in the same car. And, uh, and congratulations along the way to Dallara for that job they've done on the F2 car. Look fabulous. And, and I can't imagine the stress they've been under trying to bring in improvements to bring the F2 car more in line with the F1 car in its concept. But at the same time, not trying not make it any more expensive they can make it that way obviously it is but trying to keep the cost down as much as possible under pressure from the FIA and I think they've done a brilliant job hats off again to Delara what a great thing and 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 um Jim Paolo Delara I don't know how old he is now well in his 80s still turns up for work every day in his black top you know work clothes and um gets on with it what a racer what a great guy um so where are we going now? Let's have another, another release of all these, I'm not saying all these questions, release of the freeze that keeps going on on this chat thing. I don't know why it is. Um, okay, there's a lot of stuff going on about Red Bull. I'm not gonna go too far down that road. Um, there's lots of stuff about, um, you know, 
personal stuff I'm not going to go in that path at all um, oh here we go what's this one it's a little bit on the back of what I was just saying Mumbai oh this is from Mumbai Eastwood who I was told was I shouldn't put up question what do you make of Mohammed Ben Salayam who's the FA president being under investigation for allegedly interfering with the Formula One race last season Will he survive? Well, I don't think about that, so I can't answer that. And it doesn't sound right to me. So, sorry, I can't answer that one. Um, so, going back up the top again, it's all very, uh, lots of things. Um, Josh LCFC, do you think it's plausible that we might bring back refueling? Josh Verstappen being the last driver that underwent a massive pit fire, didn't he, in the pit stop in Hockenheim? Um, in the Benetton. What was it, the Daily Mirror in England, the tabloid said? Ignited colours of Benetton. <laughs> that was quite a good headline, actually, wasn't it? Um, might bring back refueling. Mm, to what purpose? Just because they think it'll just sort of m more strategies out there and more more changes of race? I, no, I can't see it. I just can't see it. I mean, they're trying to cut back on everything aren't they and try and make things cheaper if they can and that will only add to the expense and would they really want to see if they're trying to show that they're going electric electric 50 percent electric would they really want to see all these hoses with fuel and stuff in the race which is basically saying these cars are drinking a lot of fuel i suppose if you don't really know much about formula one i just can't see it plus the danger thing i, I really don't and then would would cars that would they be allowed then to build cars that would only take fuel for half the race distance you know stuff like that i just don't see it happening um mumbai eastwood again i've been told to ban him but don't underestimate mercedes 26 engine regulations coming back we all know what happened last time when that came around so we're saying mercedes could do well they could yeah i mean absolutely so could audi and so it's a bit of a clean sheet of paper isn't it it's a radical thing to be going to 50 percent electrification so uh, a lot of a lot of clean sheet of paper starting from square one stuff going on i think um so there we go um rolando tillett other big updates coming to the side pod inlets are we talking about mercedes here to the uh, updates we'll see in saudi arabia although as i understand it they had no issues at all with cooling on the car if they if they'd known that the engine was going to run as hot as they would as it did they would have just started with different inlets outlets which they had the capability of doing so it wasn't as if they've undesigned the car for cooling they just apparently seem to have the wrong map in the engine or something like that um okay so there we go um sen says whereabouts in spain are you peter and how did you end up living there <laughs> um well, I've always liked Spain as a country ever since I started to visit it in Formula One at Harama and then Barcelona, first at Monjuic Park and then at uh, the Barcelona circuit, obviously. And I've loved traveling around Spain over the years, various things. I once drove from the Portuguese Grand Prix to the Spanish Grand Prix across the Iberian continent there. Love it. Uh, but the big thing for me is was my son uh, getting near the end of primary school and secondary school in the UK wasn't particularly attractive to us as a family because um, he's very keen on sports specifically golf and he's pretty good and I just really wanted to give him the opportunity to be in a climate where he could play golf most days and could really stretch his talent and his ability and in addition uh, so that meant, you know, maybe we should leave England to a place with better climate. So why Spain? Spain, because they seem to have more uh, English curriculum language international schools than any other country in Europe, from what I can see and, and the research I did. And so first of all, we found the school and which is English, English curriculum, English language, but a lot of Spanish people there. It's a great school, lots of sport. And we live very near that uh, on a golf course and... Jack plays a lot of golf. Didn't have a great weekend. Didn't have a great Sunday. He played a tournament on Sunday. 
very, very windy. Never played in such cross wind in his life before. And he was going really well and then just had one horrendous hole when everything went wrong and one shot after another and that was that. But he kept his kept his chin up and then he, he actually birdied the next hole and parred the next. Uh, so he did very well in recovery. So roll on the next tournament. So that's where we are. We're southeast of Spain um, between the sea and the mountains. So in one day we have already gone to the beach and sort of paddled it wasn't warm enough to swim and then in the afternoon we drove up into the mountains and went skiing so we're not that bad you know it's a good good place to be actually uh, so there we go um rv getting back to reality now hi hi peter how much do drivers involve themselves in car design philosophies and technology or only things pertaining to car setup after cars are already built Oh, it's the latter. Yeah, very much so. Uh, but having said that, um, I mean, I've never known, I've worked with several Grand Prix drivers pretty closely. And like you or me, they can't stop picking up the phone from time to time and talking to the technical director and saying, oh, have you thought about this? Have you done that? And why are we doing this? You know, I noticed this on this car. And, and so those chats take place all the time. And it's not just the drivers. A lot of That's a lot of sort of what you might call water cooler chat. And they get very involved in that. Most of them do. The ones with, who are observant anyway. And then, yeah, the rest of it is mainly about what they want from a car and how they can make the car work most efficiently and get the best from it. So they don't um, get massively involved in the philosophy. And I suppose there's an argument these days with all the security and the longevity or not of contracts. I mean, would if, if Freddy Vasseur was contemplating replacing Carlos Sainz for 25 almost certainly he wouldn't have been involving him very much in what and won't be involving him very much obviously in what they're doing in the car for 25 so all those things but yeah you know telephones are used a lot and whatsapps are used a lot and not whatsapp really something more secure than that and they do talk a lot and I'm sure Lewis would have been saying I don't like the driving position um, why are we doing this why are the pods like that I've noticed on the Red Bull this and that all the stuff the drivers used to talk about before Formula One started taking itself too seriously and having bodyguards everywhere and PR people that told you you couldn't talk to anyone. And when journalists could walk up to drivers and talk to them, as I was lucky enough to be able to do for many, many years, they all had good opinions about cars and what was going to happen. They weren't always right, of course. <laughs> Most of the time they were wrong. But they all had good opinions about it and what made cars quick and, and what didn't. Because so, because racing is very technical, you know you can't you can't be a racing driver without, in theory, understanding quite a lot of the technology. Um, okay, so um, here we go. Uh, right, Lauren Hall. Has there been any discourse this year surrounding the dangers of racing in Saudi Arabia following the missile <laughs> during practice in twenty twenty two? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I can. I imagine there have been some questions raised, and I imagine the answer is, well, that's the race we're going. We're committed to it. All safety precautions have been taken. We're very confident that everything's going to be okay. <laughs> I think that's the answer. Everybody then says, "Oh, okay, we'll go and race then." Um, so Aaron Lag says Verstappen and Antonelli. I think he's talking about. Mercedes, isn't he? Everybody's going on about that now. Um, okay, Ricky, Ricky or Ricky, what are your thoughts on the excessive sparking we saw from the Mercs during the weekend? Um, what are my thoughts on that? I wasn't, it didn't strike me as more excessive than other, than the Red Bull or the Ferrari, to be honest. So that's my first reaction. But if I missed that, and they were sparking more i would only say that they were running at that point they were running lower than the others in which case they're playing around with seeing how low they can run without the car becoming uncomfortable to drive and that's probably what we saw and because the uh because it does get dark you know obviously when they're running those sparks were quite noticeable that's about all i can say really and i and i suppose they ran at a ride height that is pretty near the edge of what they can do 
that's what you want to do anyway. And when they went over that edge with with, with uh, lift and coast and the tyres started to degrade, they lost the balance. And indeed, as I say, Lewis, I think, might have lost his balance even in Q3 anyway with the ambient temperatures. So that's how marginal they were probably on comfortable ride height. Good question, though. Thank you. Haven't really answered it very well. Harvinder Sanilla question every team seems to have lost any belief that they can catch red bull every driver except max sounds depressed after one race is it going to be like this all year do they um well i think what we have to do maybe they do but what we have to do in support and try to cheer them all up is is tell them that well you know okay maybe the race at the front's over but there's a lot of racing in between the, the front and the back let's get on with it and let's do that and at the moment ferrari are doing the best job and Who's doing the next best job? It's a good question, isn't it? A Mercedes would probably say, we are. If we hadn't had all that trouble with the engine and the seat and everything, we'd be well ahead of McLaren. McLaren are probably saying, well, we are, because we're the customer team and we're blowing away the factory team. And Aston Martin are probably saying, well, we are, because we didn't really get it together. But when Fernando was on it, he was really quick. <laughs> so that all that little bit's quite interesting, isn't it? Um, so, yeah. We have to do that. I think, yeah, I mean, everybody, I think, was hoping that Adrian Newey would have run out of ideas and the RB20 would be a sort of bit of a little bit of a tidy up of an RB19, maybe a little bit lighter, not much else. Whereas indeed, the RB20 is quite a radical change. And that means that they've now set a new standard that all the other teams have to now have to look at, which is to start repositioning a lot of the... A lot of the stuff in the back of the car, radiators and everything else, intercoolers, and to, to give them the sort of downforce channels that the Red Bull RB20 has now got. And that's another big ask for the design teams of all these opposition teams in a year when they've got to start thinking about what they're going to do in 26 anyway. So, yeah, you know, it's no wonder they're depressed is what you can say. And I suppose the fact that they've got so many races is also quite depressing. A, from a logistics and human fatigue point of view, and it's a huge thing, the amount of travel and the effect of the travel on all human beings, regardless of their fitness and age. That's one. And two, that actually having a lot of races in the season favours Red Bull, because if the car's more or less right, they can sort of plug it in and go, whereas everybody else has to scratch around thinking, how can we improve? And at the same time, they've got to have a car that's conventional and reliable and does what it does at every race and that's that's a big ask when you've got all these different circuits that they're going to every other weekend really or every weekend um kye any more thoughts on albion's future <laughs> i think you mean alex well i haven't heard any more i haven't heard that he's turned red bull down equally i'm pretty sure he's got some sort of red bull deal on offer he didn't look to be the happiest of guys, did he, at the weekend? He looked a bit sort of stressed out about the Williams. And anyway, he sounded quite frenetic on the radio, I suppose that's the right way to phrase it. And and I think he's probably expecting a bit more. But I thought Mercedes, I thought Williams did OK. They had quite a lot of issues, but they did OK, didn't they? I thought Haas Ferrari did really well. Everybody's been saying, you know, ultra conventional car, they're probably not going to be very quick. But there they were doing a really good job maximising everything. And... Did their usual thing you know nico qualified very well had a drama in the first corner and then um and then kevin drove very well in the race they got two good drivers there and they're both good qualifiers and they're both good race drivers and they can all get it together and i've got a lot of confidence that um the new team principal um a kamatsu will do that i think he's a good guy and um i thought that was a very good first weekend for him much better weekend for has ferrari than for williams for example um, Van Balsup says why would Max go to Merck if Lewis has just left doesn't make sense well I think all this Van Balsup is if if Max is obliged for, for personal reasons to leave Red Bull I think that's what everybody's assuming when they're saying that then the team most likely to want him and the team most likely to which he's going to go is Mercedes. So that's why everyone's talking like that. It's not, oh, well, Lewis doesn't like the car. I won't go there. It'll be, if I go to Mercedes, I'll have the might of Mercedes behind me and um, I can go on and win there and that's my future forevermore, if he wanted to do that. But, you know, if he's, as long as Red Bull is Red Bull, i.e. it's Adrian Newey and it's the team that Max knows and loves, he won't leave, I don't think. 
Has Antonelli even driven an F1 car? Good question. I don't know. I, I don't actually take a lot of notice of all that Abu Dhabi post-race testing. So if he if he has, it would have been then, I would imagine. I don't think he did. I think Vesti did most of the driving on that occasion, I think. So I don't think he has, no. Josh says, Adrian going to Ferrari, what, sort of basically repeating what Peter Windsor said a long time ago and is still saying now why have, I, why have that suddenly it's come off screen sorry um yeah should be back now I don't know what that's that should be coming up now let me just check sorry oh yeah there it is um yeah I've been saying that for a long time Ferrari should have signed Adrian a long time ago for a massive amount of money and they would have got all that back and they would have won championships but it's all too late now I can't imagine he'll be doing that um so more Wow, a lot of questions. Thank you very much, everyone, for all these questions coming in thick and fast. Um, HH says, Merck will dominate 26 onwards. Breakup of Red Bull means Max and Newey to Mercedes. Okay, well, everybody's completely alive and on fire with all these rumours. Rumours! I'm not a rumour monger. <laughs> Let's talk about reality. Let's talk about... Well, I don't know. What can we talk about? George... George was a bit, what was George? Something about George and Lewis wasn't that comfortable, was it? The relationship all of a sudden. What a surprise. Imagine if that car was a quick car. Imagine the George Lewis relationship now. Um, what else can we talk about? Oscar Piastri, I thought drove pretty well in the wake of Lando. It seemed like they're having to sort of really spoon feed him when it comes to managing the tires though which is odd really you'd imagine that's okay it wasn't that easy with Pirelli's initially but he should be on to and I think it was a good race for him in that sense he got the tires through to the finish finished eighth Lando sixth so not bad at all but Lewis beat him Lewis beat him with an overheating engine and a broken seat there you go um Jaeger 7 apparently there are reliable rumors if they're reliable rumors why are they rumors <laughs> telling of an attempt of Christian Horner to acquire the Red Bull racing team with British financiers without the knowledge of the Austrian side. Ah, that was the back of... Mm -hmm. What, in the way, same way Toto's part owner of Mercedes? Is he part owner of all? I don't know. Um, Mini Light says, FIA president is under scrutiny. Really? I haven't heard that. Um, a lot of people have left though, haven't they? Uh, and I, I don't know, you know, it doesn't look to be the happiest of places to be. And um, oh, I've just got rid of my uh, chat. Sorry about all that. And let's get the pop out chat going. What's going on here? I managed to extinguish the whole thing. Um, well, I'm going to have to start again now. Not start again. I have to put a new overlay in this. Hang on a second. I don't know what I've done here. How annoying. It's the first time I've done that in about 25 live streams. It's interesting, isn't it? So bear with me while I... Oh, no. What am I doing? Um, it's still there, I think. No, it's not. Um, let me put this in browser. Okay, I hope this works. I'm going to the top now. The snaphead. Mazepin banned for what? Being Russian... I don't know. Has he been banned again? I don't know. I haven't read about that. Um, right. New Stoge, repeating to stay near the top. <laughs> okay. Sorry if I, that I hadn't got to you. Please address the differences in power unit output among teams. Having the most downforce and the highest top speed is a matter of physics. Requires the most power. Um, having the most downforce and the highest top speed requires the most power does it if you've got the most efficient downforce you could actually have the highest top speed without having the most power surely because you can run less wing than the car which has got more power so i'm not sure i would agree with that but anyway in terms of power unit we did we have talked about this quite a lot and it was all spurred by uh otna sapna of late of Alpine Renault when I asked him where the Renault engine was relative to the others and had they been given any dispensation 
to make up any sort of power difference over the winter. He said they had not, and that was denied them. But his feeling was that they were a little bit down, but not massively. <clears throat> and that everybody else was pretty much the same. Honda, Red Bull, Honda, Ferrari, oh, Honda, Red Bull, powertrain, Ferrari and Mercedes <clears throat> were pretty much the same. And most Formula One people to whom I've spoken believe that's the case. And it's mainly because of the freeze on the engine of what you can do through to the end of 2025. Not much you can do, and they're all kind of locked in place. But it's but you can have different gear ratios, and it was quite interesting. Each team can select its own ratios for the year, and it's quite interesting to see how different the the gear the gears were around Bahrain, and where some some drivers were getting six before the kink others were keeping it in fifth some were taking turn 10 in second some in third mainly it was the really good guys who were using the longer gears even within a team it had Charles in 10 using third through 210 Carlos usually second for example whereas both McLaren drivers were using second through turn 10 but um, difference in gears but generally that's just a characteristic of the power band rather than overall power so I don't think there's a lot of difference between them Shiraz Hussain, thoughts on Schumacher pole lap at Monaco 2012, age 43. Would love to hear your thoughts on his attack on the final flying lap, one-handed through the swimming pool. Yeah, yeah, I remember that lap. It was wonderful. And I was jumping up and down. And it was so annoying, wasn't it? Because he didn't actually get the pole, did he? It was the quickest lap from memory. But he didn't, there was some, didn't he have a penalty or something ridiculous? But um, yeah, he drove really well, age 43. And... Um, it just shows, you know, Lewis has got a lot ahead of him in terms of his age. No question if he keeps fit, which I'm sure he will, and motivated, which I'm sure he will now at Ferrari. He's, he's going to be driving really well in the latter stages of his career. So, you know, don't and remember age 44, Jack Brabham was as quick as anybody in the world, almost won the world championship in 1970 against Jochen Rindt, who arguably was the fastest driver in the world at that point. So, yeah, age. Is age an issue at all? I don't think so. <laughs> um, Yossi Weiss. Hi, Peter. What would be your ideal engine rigs? The reason I'm reading that slowly, Weiss, is because it reminds me of Franz Weiss, Weiss who was an incredibly good engine builder for McLaren in the Can-Am days. Really good engine builder. I wonder if you're in your relation, Yossi. Um, to be asking a question like that. Interesting. Uh, what, what would be your ideal engine rigs? I have a lot of discussion about engines with my son, Jack. And he asks questions like, Dad, has there ever been a W16 or a W24? And is a straight eight any quicker than a V6? <laughs> All this stuff. Um, I don't know. I was looking at the Coventry Climax flat 16, one and a half litre Formula One engine that was never raced the other day. What an engine that was. Brilliant. Uh, Wally Hassan at his very best. I love multi-cylinder, non-turbo engines, really. Hard to beat them. I mean, you, you're asking a guy that was at Clermont Ferrand in 72 when Chris Amon was dominating the French Grand Prix in the V12 Matra, revving it to whatever, 17, 18,000 revs through the mountains of Clermont and you know when you hear sounds like that I mean even a V12 BRM was impressive let alone a Matra and I actually prefer that sort of throatier multi-cylinder sound to the high revving V8s and V10s of more recent times and they were just fabulous engines and turbos have always sort of flattened them a little bit I think and those if I had to hark back to an engine, I mean, having said all of that, there's, it's hard to beat the sound of a Cosworth DFV on overrun on a crisp early morning, Sunday morning warm up. And the sort of the engine's running quite rich and it's sort of banging and popping as they're going down into the hairpin, going back down through the gears. I mean, a Cosworth V8, great sounding engine as well. So, yeah, I'd go back to Cosworth V8s, I think. <laughs> I like engine formulae that are promote reliability and not massively expensive and that's where we were with the v8s and v10s before the whole hybrid thing began and when the prices trebled for the cost of leasing an engine package deal for the year if you're a customer team they trebled overnight uh, from about 12 to over 30 so i'd love to go back to those multi-cylinder engines but it'll never happen um 
and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not the right person to ask this because I'm never going to give an answer along the lines of electric engines or electrification, I'm afraid. So rather than put my foot in it socially, um, politically, I'm going to bow out gracefully and say, I think um, I, I miss the Cosworth DFE and I miss Chris Amon in a V12 Matra. And I miss Chris in a V12 Ferrari, for that matter. And Jim Clark in a Cosworth DFE. Um, Nick Bosman. Oh, yes. Another question which got lost at the top of the chat. Yeah, sorry. Why would Formula One not recognize the legal the legacy Andretti would bring to Formula One? The man has had seriously impressive career thoughts. You're absolutely right. And I've said that absolutely. Um, I've said that many times. I think it's an absolute disgrace. And his his legacy and his contribution also to motorsport in general and to Formula One has been enormous and his contribution to Lotus, to Ferrari um, and to other Formula One teams and the American Parnelli team and March, you know, he, the guy is an absolute icon and that's Mario. It's his son, obviously, Michael, who's tried to put this Formula One team together, but the whole thing is the Andretti name and the Andretti legacy, as you say. And for it to be dismissed like that with words along the lines of, um, we're not sure the team will be competitive and Andretti needs Formula One much more than Formula One needs Andretti, which I thought was despicable. To me, you know, I'm not happy with the FIA. I'm not happy with the governing body of the sport that they are prepared to do that and say that. And as I said in the last live stream, they, if, they, if, they, if they were dominated by the teams, the Formula One teams saying, we do not want Andretti taking a slice of the cake, which is already too small for each of us, and it's going to make it even smaller. We do not want him. We're not going to agree to have him in Formula One. If that was the reason, I think the FIA, A, could have put out a much better press statement than they did, and, and it should have, should have been absolutely um, conciliatory and, and respectful of the Andretti name, and wasn't. But beyond that, I think they should have, I think they've missed a trick because I think they should have said, but we're not going to let this go and we're going to look at it again in 26, at which time, in theory, we're probably going to want Andretti to come up with even more money in terms of what he can bring to the sport and how he's going to do the team. And between now and 26, we're going to help Andretti raise that money in America and help along the way raise Formula One's profile in the United States. And let's work with the Andrettis, if that's what they needed, more money, to do that. And they missed that trick as well. What easier way of selling Formula One in the United States than doing it around the Andretti name? And they didn't even do that. And I don't blame Liberty for this. I blame the FIA because they're the people that put out that press statement. It was an FIA press media communication. So that's why I'm saying that. And I think it was absolutely wrong for them to do it. A, to make the, I think the decision was wrong in the first place, but to, the way they put it out was was despicable. And um, and, they, and along the way, they've missed a trick now of actually working with the Andretti name to help Formula One grow in, in the United States. And regardless of what they say, the Andretti name is as big as Formula One in America, for sure. And if the survey they did discounted that, then they should fire the company that did the survey. And they should be working with the Andretti's, raising more money to help the Andretti's come into Formula One. It should be a helpful thing rather than a negative, destructive thing. So there you go. Bono Bronk says, politics and sport ought not to be mixed. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right there, Bono. And I wish it was the case. But why is it not the case? I can tell you why. Because when a sport um, attracts the sort of money that Formula One needs in order to survive and therefore creates the sort of egos that comes with the money, politics enters into it. Have money, have ego, what have you got? Politics. Very sad, very true. Um, Carl Givers, nice crack at WhatsApp there, Peter, considering Horner's alleged indiscretions. Really, I haven't been following this and I don't know if he's been using WhatsApp or whatever. So <laughs> I use WhatsApp. Uh, that's why I said that. But then I quickly changed it, I think, and I said, oh, something a bit more secure, didn't I? But if you want to read into that, what you did, yeah, fair enough. Um, what's this? Uh, <laughs> Chizkovip1 Walker. Given the fact that the Red Bull is able to leave the rest of the cars without DRS, is it possible for the rest 
uh, the rest to get to Red Bull level this season. Yeah, well, I did predict, didn't I, uh, on, in the qualifying video that if Max won the drag race to the first corner, which he was always going to do, and got out of the first corner in one piece, which he did, then he would just blitz that first lap, particularly sector one, which he did. And um, yeah, and nobody seems to be talking about the top speed advantage that Red Bull have. I mean, Max said very circumspectly after Bahrain, didn't he? He said, oh, I'm not sure what it's going to be like in Saudi Arabia. We've got some really quick corners there and need a lot of downforce. Yeah, and you don't have that at Red Bull, Max. Anyway, we'll see. Maybe you know something that we don't about the Red Bull. Maybe they're going to be cramming on a massive amount of wing and be incredibly slow on the straight. Yeah, right. Um... Blues almighty, do you think we will see a rule change to protect the teams from damage caused by the track like the drain lids did? Well, if anybody was going to uh, enforce such a rule change, you would imagine it would have been Freddie Vasseur last year, last winter, after what happened to Carlos Sainz in Vegas. So the fact that nothing happened suggests that the way the contracts have been drawn up, that they're not liable? I don't know. I, I suppose they can just take the license away or find them, I suppose. when thing, and Maybe they did find them. I don't know. But I need to check that. But whether they would it be part of the rules, you know, I, I'd be surprised if that would be part of the rules, given Liberty's desire to want to have more and more races in streets in big cities around the world with key names like Chicago, Vegas. Yeah. Um, Miami so I doubt they want to restrict themselves with rule changes but I think fines for sure I mean if the if that had to be borne by Ferrari's insurance company then for sure there would have been an increase in the old annual premium wouldn't there um, and then we did have that drama in the Bahrain test didn't we we lost time with the with the rain thing Peacemaker, that's a nice name. What do you think it's going to be the progress of Aston Martin through the season and the 25 upcoming one? Salutations from Spain. Thank you, Peacemaker. Um, oh, I think they'll get, they'll go very well. Will they beat Mercedes in the championship? I doubt it. Will they beat Ferrari in the championship? I doubt it. Will they beat McLaren in the championship? I doubt it, actually. So I think they'll probably be where they are now. They'll certainly have their days. There are so many races, so many different circuits, so many pressures coming from logistics and everything else that the day will come when Aston Martin will get a fab. They might even win a race this year. I'm not saying they won't. But I think over a season, it's hard to see them beating Red Bull, Ferrari, Mercedes and McLaren on what we've seen so far. But like I say, you know, a wet race, something happens, Lance Stroll could magically win or Fernando could get the win that he so richly deserves. So um, that could happen. Crofty, if Alonso was to leave Aston Martin this year, what lineup could you see them having for 25? Um, well, it would have to be a driver that Lance and Lawrence are happy with. In other words, a driver that's um, possibly beatable from time to time and that Lance can get quite close to or maybe slightly out-qualify from time to time and look good against and who's going to be very nice about Lance and the team and the stroll and everything else which Fernando's doing pretty well I mean he's fitting the role pretty well I think isn't he uh, there are occasions when Lance gets somewhere near him and people can say wow Lance isn't bad but if he goes Let's say they got Carlos. I mean, Carlos Sainz would be the sort of driver they would like, I would imagine, because Lance would think, yeah, I, I'm as quick as Sainz. I can do Sainz. So he'd want Sainz because Sainz is a Grand Prix winner and he's a Ferrari star. And every time Lance gets near him or outqualifies him, which he might, uh, he'd look good. So he'd be a guy that they would look at, I would imagine. Uh, who else? They would probably not want Botas. They probably think he's not quick enough to win Grand Prix again I imagine that's what they would think what if somebody like Guanya Zhou was on the market would they get him maybe maybe um, I don't know how much I mean it's hard to tell how much they think they need a class 
Grand Prix winning, World Championship winning driver in one car and Lance in the other. It could be that behind the scenes they're thinking, well, Fernando's a bit quick, isn't he? You know, maybe we need somebody a bit, a bit nearer Lance. I doubt they're thinking that way at the moment, but they might. Um, so <laughs> I'm being, I'm not really being cynical. I think that really is the situation. I can't imagine that Lawrence Stroll would be in Formula One if he didn't think his son could win Grand Prix and potentially win World Championships in the right car. And he wants to create that car. And I don't think we should ever forget that. Um, so who else would there be? I mean, whoever, if George ever was available, they'd go for George probably. Um, Perez maybe, if he was available. Yeah, they might go for Perez. I mean, there's a Grand Prix winning driver who's finished, what, second in a world championship. And so he's a good guy. I mean, Lance could beat him. On, on his day and <clears throat> he would look quite good alongside Perez probably and Perez would bring a bit of money so he's another guy I suppose they would do along the similar lines Scott Peterson hi Peter really hoping Aston can give Alonso a car that allows him to compete for race wins was Bahrain a track not suited for their car and any hope for a better run this weekend um what did Fernando say after qualifying I think he said the usual sort of thing, didn't he? We didn't get the best from the car. We're a bit disappointed, but we're looking forward to the race because our race pace is good. <clears throat> but then his race pace wasn't that good. It was pretty hopeless on full tanks. And yeah, he did quite well at the end of the race on the you know newish set of white of soft of hard tires. What did he do? Because um, he stopped very late, so there's a new set. He did thirty four one. Yeah, okay. And Charles had done thirty four zero with a lot more fuel in the car and the brake problem. So. You know, I don't think I don't think they're any quicker than a McLaren or a Mercedes. And I think they can be there. And I think they were probably a little bit below par in qualifying. But as I've said several times, I don't I've never seen Fernando, unless he's got a real advantage, I've never seen him as a great, great qualifier. I've seen him as a great, great racing driver. And some circuits when he doesn't qualify well, it's always a problem for him come race day because he's just going to get locked in traffic and it was a little bit like that in Bahrain and in Saudi Arabia in theory it should be an easier task because three DRS zones lots of straights you know drag race circuit really isn't it so they may be in quite good shape there and Fernando in a race situation like that will always do well there is a story about the default Simtech being given a Mugen Honda power plant in 97 and it was very fast. Is there any truth in this? Um, I've had to have to unscroll it to get it to read and probably the question uh, hasn't come up. Um, okay, here, here we go. Um, haven't heard that to be honest. So I don't know. Nick Worth, Simtech. Aerodynamicist, close to Max Mosley. Um, don't know. Don't know what to say really. I, I haven't heard that. Maybe it's true. Simtech was the team, of course, the car that poor Roland Ratzenberg, Roland Ratzenberger was driving at Imola in '94 when uh, the cars, and that was that first year of those ridiculous regulations post. Hockenheim agreement of August 93 when basically everything was banned all the active ride everything the cars came into 94 with no suspension rock hard with a plank and every time they hit a curb they just jumped up in the air and that's what happened to Rubens on the Friday at, at Imola hit a curb at the chicane launched him into the wall lucky to survive that and then the next day uh, Roland hit something maybe a curb ran wide something to do with the car you know just juddering off track and as they did in those days and damaged the left or did, something did something dislodged something in the left front wing and then the following lap he sort of went up back onto the track tried to clean up the tires and came around and then the following lap high speed braking didn't come into the pits um high speed braking for toza there's something broke at the on that front wing and the car just turned sharp left and he was killed so that was yeah, but that that was 94. I mean, you're asking about 97, so there's no relationship, obviously. Um, but Simtech always had a very good wind tunnel. Nick Worth there. Um, okay, 
this is another one about Christian and brawling and stuff. I'm not going to get into all that. Where are we? Um, the Verstappens. No. Everybody loves all this. My view is I'm just going to let the dust settle and see what happens. Really. Um, right. Amol, Anmol Singal. Is the budget cap promoting lack of competition since other than owners, no one really gets more money even if they win? <laughs> so you think... I was about to say, well, yeah, it's it's actually hurting the competition because it's not allowing the teams that can afford to do mid-season serious upgrades to do those serious upgrades to take the race to Red Bull. But you're not saying that. You're saying is the budget cap promoting lack of competition because nobody gets any more money than they win. Uh, uh, Formula One's not really like that because it's not a prize money sport. The drivers don't race for the prize money. They race for... They race for the retainer that they're paid and they get a bit of bonus, but it's the retainer the driver has with the team for the year that is the key thing. And of course, the team get money based on their performance uh, over a long period of time, not just one year. And it's and that money comes from the circuit promoters and TV rights, basically. So when a driver... So if, if Nick, Nico Hulkenberg won the... Saudi Arabian Grand Prix he wouldn't get he'd get a bit of a bonus but it wouldn't massively affect his income and Haas would get a little bit more money but it wouldn't radically they wouldn't get as much as if Red Bull won the, the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix because they've been building up this credit if you like over a period of time so it's so that so the budget cap hasn't really affected any of that that system's been in place since Bernie was orchestrating the sport and it's still the situation today with minor revisions but basically still the same so yeah it's not a prize money thing and um it doesn't really and the budget that's the one area the budget cap doesn't really affect i think dave schiff interesting question should the promoters of miami austin and vegas have provided more support for andretti well on the basis that I, I say it's an FIA thing, I believe they should have. The reason they didn't is that they probably find it hard to distinguish the lines between the FIA and Liberty. And Liberty ultimately are the, are the company that they're doing business with in terms of promoting the Formula One race at Vegas or Miami or Austin. And, and so they wouldn't have wanted to have rocked that Liberty boat and they would have respected Liberty's position. And they would assume, I imagine, that Liberty would have their own relationship with the FIA when it came to things like the Andretti application. But it, as it turns out, I think it was mainly FIA and I think I think um, they would have benefited. I think Andretti would have benefited had those teams beaten the drum a little bit louder. As I say, the big fault was not realising that there is a future in the United States with the Andretti name, even if they're not racing for the next couple of years, working with the Andretti name to develop this mega American team coming into Formula One with a great name that it is for, ten, for 2026 or even 2027 and whenever they wanted to do it, working with Cadillac, you know, it's a mega thing. And they just, um, they just blew it and they didn't even think about that, I guess. Oh no, we've never done that before. So why should we do it again? Well, it's a new world out there, I'm afraid. And that's what they should have done in my view. Nish says, Lewis tried to sacrifice one lap pace for race pace and still struggled in the race. Is it fair to say Mercedes and the drivers still don't understand the direction taken and the philosophy of the new car? A point I made at the start of the show, and I'm very happy to repeat it, that Lewis did make that claim. And, and I, as I said in my video on the, on the Friday night, you know, the proof will be now, and Lewis has said that, and it's a bit of a sort of cliche that a lot of drivers come up with all the teams do oh you know we weren't really setting the car up for qualifying but the race is a different thing Aston Martin a little bit along those lines as well um, but if they don't go well in the race the next day then how do they explain that A and B usually everyone rushes off anyway so everybody's forgotten about it but in this case I'm pleased to see Nish you haven't forgotten about it and I certainly didn't forget about it and you'd have to ask that question the mitigating circumstance of course is that Lewis's race was completely coloured by two things one the overheating issues on the Mercedes and two, that weird sensation he would have had when the little lug under the seat broke and he was sort of slightly off skew in the cockpit. Um, but for a driver who's used to driving a car with a very forward, uncomfortable driving position, actually having his seat break in a car with the driving position further back shouldn't have made much difference, he says with a smile. Um, so 
my answer to your question is yeah I do on the basis that I don't think I look at it the other way I don't think George's focus if you like on a one lap blistering tire special hurt him in the race at all you know he was pretty good wasn't he admittedly he had the problem with the engine cooling and the tires went off and blah 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 but it didn't look as if his setup which in theory was contrary to Lewis's was a terrible thing to have in the race so um yeah missed that oh, so thank you for that it's a good question um well spotted uh so that one um so done that one Gandalf the Fool says, I miss Peter streaming on Twitch. Fewer people then, but much more sophisticated questions rather than many silly questions. Uh, 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 there's an LOL at the end of it. No, I don't think so. I think, if I may say so, probably famous last words, touch wood. I think the standard of questions and comments is very high on YouTube and I'm surprised and, and I'm happily surprised by how well it's gone. I was a bit nervous about it. Twitch, I agree, was good, but I just didn't see the end game at Twitch. I still don't see it. They didn't seem to be, I mean, they approached me to do this on the basis that they really wanted to expand Twitch well beyond gaming into having this sort of show, podcast shows about sports like Formula One and in theory, the way we do this show. And I was embraced, I embraced that. I thought, wow, that's really good. You know, they're owned by Google, I think, and really good. But there was no backup, no support, no interest, nothing. I'm talking from the Twitch people now, not the fans. And um, I just thought, not really. Whereas YouTube, actually, I think, if I may say so again, touch wood, famous last words, seem to do a very good job. And certainly, I don't need to touch wood here. I think you, the fans, are doing a great job. No, that's a condescending thing to say. I'm, I'm humbled and, and very happy with the way the questioning and the comments go. A few comments aside. Um, Casual fan says, where do you think Carlos will end up next season? Well, I think he I think he will succumb to the lure of a team like Red Bull or Merck if they've got a slot. If you know if they if they want to replace Sergio, I think he'll go there. And if they want to replace um they want to plug in maybe before Kimi races in to say twenty seven, they postpone it till twenty seven. Carlos will probably take that. Um and I think he might even go to Aston Martin if they decide, if Fernando decides he's going somewhere else, if he gets an offer to go somewhere. Um, but I personally think, as I've said many times now, I think if I was managing Carlos, I'd be on the phone to him a lot and I'd be annoying him over dinner saying, I think you should go to Audi. And uh, and I and I just think, it's I love the idea of growing organically with the team, especially if you're a driver like Carlos, it's got a lot of road dust now and you've kind of been there, done that. And... He, wherever he goes, if he doesn't, apart from Aston, but if he goes to Red Bull or Mercedes, if there is a slot there, he's always going to be up against somebody that's going to be difficult. So why not go there as a super, super number one driver at Audi and be their man for the next 10 years in Formula One and, you know, and represent the brand forevermore? That's what I would do. And I think that deal would be there for, t for the taking right now because that's a great thing for Audi to do. But they may not. Speaking of which... I couldn't believe it today. I mean, Alpine, they got, they've got a lot of good people have left um, Alpine. And yet another, um, another email came in from Al Alpine today. God, just more changes. So what's happened now is that, um, what's happened? Um, Sorry, I'm just saying now that now announces this announces that the team's technical director Matt Harmon and head of aerodynamics Dirk De Beer, who's been around a long time, he's got a very good reputation, have chosen to leave the team and to seek new challenges. So they're now being replaced by <clears throat> let's talk about convoluted. The BWT Alpine Formula One team and they introduces a series of organizational changes throughout its technical teams. Throughout its technical teams, where it will need a where it will take a new three-pillared approach. I mean, talk about complicating it. The team has created three specialized technical roles, technical director performance, technical director aerodynamics, and technical director engineering, replacing the previous structure of just technical director. <laughs> I mean, what would Patrick Head say about all that? If you can't design a complete car, you shouldn't be getting out of bed in the morning anyway. That's what he would say. And the engine along the way. Anyway, 
that's how been good luck to them hope they hope they get all the answers they want and they're right back in the fray um w r e a g f e says carlos will end up in checo's seat okay well there you go um as i say you you'd, if you were genuinely involved with all that move you would say you would have to say okay what is carlos going to bring to the team that we don't have with Checo at the moment. And some of you out there, probably many of you out there say, oh, well, he's quicker. But don't underestimate Sergio Perez. He's won, I don't know how many races he's won. He's won three or four races, isn't he, with Red Bull. He's not that slow. He's quite capable of winning Grand Prix in his own right. And he brings good money to the team. And, and most of the time he stays quiet and does his own thing, which is good news. And so, Yes, of course, Carlos would fit in very well alongside Max Verstappen. But would he be a happy camper there? Because he, he would get beaten by Max big time. And so would he really enjoy it, do you think? I don't. Whereas Sergio is kind of used to getting blown away now and it kind of works, doesn't it? Um, so there you go. So... <clears throat> Shanty Gaming says, the only thing I worry about Haas is just developing the car through the season. Yeah, but um, who was it? Oh, well, Williams was saying, you know, we, we haven't changed the rear suspension. We're running the old gearbox because we want to sort of save the money and do some other stuff, more upgrades. And so why don't we think that Haas would do that? I like to think that it's not just running the race team, but you know, in terms of the team principles role, I think they'll be looking at trying to generate more money coming into the team now. And I think they might well do that. And if they have a little bit of extra cash, I think they could be able to do it. I don't think they're on the absolute limit, are they, in terms of what they can do? If they are, they're doing an amazing job. They're doing a, an Aguri Suzuki job, aren't they? Gary T. Peter, could Andretti buy out Alpine? Yeah, of course he could. Uh, Michael, M Mario, the whole Andretti thing, of course he could. That's what Formula One wants they're not saying we don't like andretti or we don't want andretti they're saying if, if andretti wants to come in they got to buy one of our franchises that's what they want they don't want a new franchise created because it'll eat into their franchise so yeah they can buy toro rosso visa cash app minardi whatever tyrell and they can buy alpine for sure i think alpine would sell it too the problem is all these teams price themselves out of existence now they would all want ridiculous money and ultimately, Michael would say, well, why the hell? Do Sorry, I shouldn't say that. Why do we need to spend that amount of money just buying a franchise when we know we can do the team better from square one, are creating our own new car, our own new team the way we want to do it? Why do we have to buy all that inherent stuff at a massive premium just to get into Formula One? That's not what we want to do. We want to tell the story of starting an American team, doing it the American way, the Andretti way. And they're right. They shouldn't have to waste all that money buying Alpine. Go and do your own thing. But yeah, they could. They could buy out. I mean, they, I would I'd imagine that Haas would sell. I imagine Alpine would sell. And I imagine Visa Cash App would sell. I don't think anybody else would. Maybe Williams. Maybe Williams. Um, Bill S. Well, this is a question for Scarves, if ever there was one. What do you make of Red Bull using front tyre inwash instead of outwash? Are there any other teams, do, teams doing this? Don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. Is this all to do with their... It's nothing to do with their angled front suspension because other teams have got that now, haven't they? And including Mercedes. So, uh, yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if that's what Adrian is also doing. But it's something I'd, write, I'd rather pass on to Scarbs to explain, first of all, to me, and then secondly to you, because all that stuff. It's so esoteric now, isn't it? In the old days, you could say, oh, he's got a new airbox on the car. It's a big airbox. Oh, well, they've moved the battery to the back of the gearbox. Oh, look, they've got a transverse gearbox now. You can see all these things on the car. Now it's all in-wash, out-wash. Yeah, anyway. Sean Hunt. Here's a basic question. Can Formula One survive another season of total domination by Red Bull? Well, if you're Liberty now, what are you thinking? Are you thinking, oh, this is the end. Red Bull are going to win again. I don't think, I don't think you, I mean, the only thing 
that would ultimately be a problem for liberty would be if the TV rights revenues dropped 30 to 40 percent over a sort of en masse between one renewal period and another because the racing was boring and the number of racetracks in the world wanting to put up the money to go racing at the premium liberty want and the teams want suddenly fell off the cliff and we didn't have enough races and what would happen then is that formula one would just have to tighten its belt even more and and a new budget cap would come in have to reduce costs altogether uh, more costs so and i'm being practical here formula one of course can survive and will survive for sure i think the real question is can it continue to expand and grow the way it is with the next generation which has happened through netflix and other ways that formula one has promoted itself with new races in the united states and other countries and so forth and I'm just doing up a loose bolt on my mic here. I hope that's not making too much noise. I don't know why that's so loose anyway. Um, and that's that's an issue. And I've said many times, I, I, I personally don't think it's a, a problem because even in a, a Red Bull dominated period of Formula One, you can start creating other Netflix shows around the, the engineering of the cars or around the logistics or around the motorhomers or around the mechanics. There's so much stuff there that hasn't yet been touched that Formula One can create this incredible, uh, I think, um, incredible movie, ongoing real life movie of what, what it's all about. And there's so much stuff, there's so many stories to tell, so many lives to share that I think we're only scratching the surface. And all that would defy what is actually going on on the racetrack, whether it's close racing or not. And I don't still, I still don't know what the actual um, ratio is between young viewers who are watching Netflix, Formula One on Netflix and young viewers who are then migrating to watching Formula One races live and adding to, if you like, the overall commercial pool of Formula One and, and by enhancing television rights money and the number of races on the calendar. That's an interesting number, which we don't see a lot of uh, detail about. Yes, of course, some people do. But at the moment, there's a big disconnect probably between what you see on Netflix and what you actually see when the race goes live and the lights go out. That's for sure. Depends a little bit on the commentary teams involved and what they're talking about as well. I mean, if the, if the commentary team's constantly moaning about how boring it is, most people are going to walk away thinking this is really boring. But if the commentary team is saying, wow, did you see what Max Verstappen just did through turn nine? Did you see the turn in he had? And did you see the rotation? Unbelievable. Let's do a replay of that. You know, you can get excited about a lot of stuff. But generally, I don't think commentary teams do that, do they? They tend to ramble on about whatever subject they're going on. If the race is boring, they tend to start going off at tangents and talking about who might replace, um, you know, wh where Carlos Sainz might race next year. And they talk about that for three laps or something. Um, so. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So Aditya Parashar says there is a planned test in 2023 car for Antonelli. Yeah, but I think we're talking about a 24 car. Well, I mean, I, well, I think the question was, Aditya, with respect, I think the question was, has he, when I, this is how I read these questions anyway, in 23, did Antonelli drive a 23 car? Or in 24, is he going to drive a 24 car? And I think the answer is no. Of course, yeah, he driven a, he will drive an older car. And I'd be surprised if he hasn't driven an older Formula One car by now already in some description. But um, yeah, thank you for that. So we've done that question. A lot of people are starting to get quite clever, actually. And they're asking the question twice on the basis that they realize that Windsor is going from top to bottom of the scroll. And if they asked it quite late, they need to ask it again. Very good. Thank you. No problem with me. Um, Diego Marino. Hey, Diego. Good man. Following Bahrain, on which races can you see Ferrari being a threat to take a victory from Red Bull or not? Well, Diego, I think before it was last year, it was relatively clear that on a circuit with quite a high top speed and premium on high speed braking and some fairly perfunctory corners, i.e. Monza with only about three corners and Singapore with lots of stop start 90 degree corners, Ferrari pretty good 
um, corners like that. I don't think it's the same now, is it? Because on the basis of Bahrain, it looks as if Ferrari's top speed advantage has gone away. Um, actually, they completely lost it to Red Bull. That's the evidence of Bahrain. It may not be the case in Saudi Arabia. We'll wait and see. But that's the evidence of Bahrain was that. And if that's the case, then Ferrari need to be... Then they're, then they're in trouble, really. They get, they're going to be thinking, the only thing we can do is just increase the sweet spot in which we operate the car give ourselves a car that is drivable and manageable and predictable every race and then try to do the best race management job we can in terms of strategy pit work reliability and then try to put as much pressure as we can on red bull and inevitably red bull at some point are going to have some weak races and we're going to be there to to take advantage of that but only if we if we really sustain reliability and and that sort of performance race in race out very difficult to do of course and already as we saw in Bahrain you know technical problems on the Leclerc car but a good 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 race by by Carlos Sainz and not too far away from Sergio Perez I mean I think Sergio had been in hand on the soft tires at the end and he was just sort of backing off just making sure that he got to the finish but he definitely um it was yeah it was it was reasonably close so that will be an encouragement for them but I think the big news from Bahrain, from a Ferrari perspective, I think, is that the top speed advantage has gone away. It hasn't gone down the toilet, but it's gone away. And But they have got a reasonably big spot, a sweet spot now, I think, in which to operate. Yuppie Dewey one I haven't really pronounced it very well, Yuppie, but anyway, thank you for your question. Is Stroll good enough for Formula 1? Do you mean Lance or Lawrence? Uh, <laughs> um, that was a joke. Lawrence... Stroll definitely has the money to be in Formula One. That's all you need. And uh, he's there, so doing that. Uh, Lance, don't forget this guy's qualified on the front row. He, he nearly won that Turkish Grand Prix, didn't he? And he's pretty good in the wet. And he thinks quite a lot, I guess, about his racing. But he does get involved in a lot of first corners, doesn't he? This one, he said, was not his fault. He got tapped by Nico Hulkenberg. Hulkenberg says, you know, what was he supposed to do when the guy sort of it's goes up on a curve and goes sideways in front of him um so take from that what you will and botas was involved an innocent bystander so yeah lance needs to in my opinion he certainly needs to well he needs to do two things he needs to be better in qualifying and as good in qualifying as he used to be i think he seems to have fallen off in qualifying a bit i don't know why uh, maybe since Fernando's come in and just sort of basically been much quicker than Sebastian Vettel ever was relative to Lance. And that's kind of detuned him a bit. Or uh, So I think he needs to improve his one lap performance. And I think he needs to be calmer in first corners. And he needs to be, his mentality into first corners means, should be, I'm going to make sure nobody hits me and I don't hit anybody. Rather than, I'm going to break late and see if I can get a gap here. You can do that for a while going towards the first corner, but there is a moment when you have to go into Nicky Loud or Alan Prost mode of now my car is surrounded by cotton wool. I don't want anybody touching it until I come out of this corner <clears throat> and I'm going to go racing. So um, that's, and I think that's what he needs to do. <clears throat> and I think he races quite well, as we saw in Bahrain. I mean, he, did, he drove pretty well from nowhere back into the points, well, the last point anyway, P10. Um... Glenn says people blaming Formula One is boring. We had the Schumacher era, Lewis's era, and now the ultimate Mac era. Yeah, well, we have these eras of domination, don't we? I just wish I'd been around in 1965 when Jim Clark was dominating Formula One. I would have loved to have seen that. Every race I would have absolutely been on the edge of my seat watching Jimmy go round and round and round, winning by three laps. Brilliant. Sean Hunt. Our Mercedes finished as a front-running team three years of ground effect regulations and they still can't figure it out <laughs> well come on give them a break one race i mean the big shock for me was the unreliability the heating and the overheating and the tires and the seat and lewis's losing lewis quickest on you know full tanks and light tanks on in fp1 fp2 it comes to qualifying and he goes slower in Q3 than he did in Q2 because the balance has gone away. What's that all about? I mean, maybe that is 
exactly what you are saying, Sean. Maybe you're actually actually saying they still can't figure it out. And I did say when Scarb started going on about how they were going to not going on, Scarb started explaining beautifully, as he always does, about how Mercedes have got all this different anti dive geometry. Now they can change from circuit to circuit. I thought, wow, you know, <laughs> talk about complicating things which they haven't actually got sorted out in a basic level yet. Um, and so let's have a look at what Toto said after the race, because <clears throat> I think it's quite well, I don't know what it'll be really, but it'll be interesting to see what he says, just to reread it now with the hindsight of a couple of days, um, just to see what he said after the race and from my thing, you know, Bahrain Grand Prix Saturday. Toto, we got the cooling level wrong today and that cost us. To manage the issue, we had to do a lot more lift and coasting and then you lose performance with the tyres. It's a vicious circle. We need to look at what we did wrong as we gave the drivers a car that was not competitive enough today. I'm keen to look at the data to make sure we don't face similar changes in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. At the end of the day, though, we had a brand new car, unlike everybody else, um, and we're learning about it. We have seen the glimpses of performance here in Bahrain, but we couldn't materialize that today. We will go away and make sure we build on our, on our learning and come back stronger. And Andy Shovlin, trackside engineering director, said the race proved an underwhelming and frustrating experience today. Well, they're pretty honest, aren't they, really? That's quite good, I think. They've both been quite honest about it. No mention of the seat, though, <laughs> interestingly, as I keep saying. Because um, you would have thought, you know, congratulations to Lewis for finishing the race with a broken seat mounting. But no. Um, yeah. Are they finished as a front running team? I think we're probably near to saying certainly up until 2026, they probably are. Yeah. I mean, 26 is a completely new ball game with the new regulations, 50% electrification of the engine. You've got to assume Mercedes powertrain stroke Ilmore stroke Cosworth, Ilmore, Cosworth begat Ilmore, which begat Mercedes powertrains. And so they're all, you know, that's good, good operation there. They should have a great power unit, I imagine, in 26. But as between now and then, with Red Bull having taken the quantum leap they have with the RB20, as it would appear, then, as we said all along, when, when we were talking, when we've been talking in these live streams over the last year or so about should Mercedes just go and do a Red Bull, get rid of the zero pod design? The answer was always, well, that's all very well, because all they'll do is they won't understand what they've done, but they will have then reproduced, if you like, a Red Bull, at which point Red Bull have got, will have gone two steps ahead anyway. And that's, that's exactly what's happened, isn't it? You know, Red Bull, Adrian Newey and the team, and the team is an important three words in italics, is just excelled themselves in what they've done with the RB20. And the RB19 was a bigger step forward. Anyway, um, LOL, Shanty Gaming says, what about Renault? Yeah, well, I just read that, all that news about Renault and Alpine and the new triple. Oh, wow, nice Canadian maple leaf on your thing, by the way. Very nice, thank you. Uh, I'll say thank you, I mean, good to see. Um, yeah, all that stuff. New three heads of technical. I mean, too many heads, too many meetings, too, many middle, too much middle management. I mean, the, the way to design a car, obviously, is the way Adrian Newey works. Get it done. It's a sort of slightly refined version of Patrick Head putting his fist down on the table and saying, do it now. I don't care if it's four o'clock on a Sunday morning. Get on with it. Anyway, <laughs> it doesn't happen anymore in Formula One, I don't think. Um, uh, I'm so late, says Main Postma. I love this podcast. Thank you very much. Well, I love having you on the podcast. Thank you very much. Main Postma. Nice name. Thank you. Um, Bot Logan. If Audi stays the course, science to Audi makes the most sense. Great. I've got somebody, actually somebody on the planet Earth who agrees with me. Good. Thank you, Bot. Yeah, of course it does. Uh, but it wouldn't agree. I'm sure Carlos at the moment wouldn't agree with that. He would say, oh, Windsor, what, that, what do you know? You, you know what you're talking about? I want to go to Mercedes, much better car. <coughs> or wherever. <coughs> Excuse me. Not 100%, but nearly there. Um, have a bit more. Yes. But um, he would always have, you know, somebody annoying to have to race against. Whereas in Audi, it can be his own team. 
<coughs> not a bad thing, eh? That cool Sauber team in Switzerland, bring that to life, kick it into life. And uh, Audi, all that German technology, going back to the days of Ferdinand Porsche and the Auto Union, Bernd Rosmeyer, mega, Hans Stuck, great. That's where Carlos belongs. Um, so that was a good one. Thank you very much for agreeing. I'm sure anybody else agrees with us, mate, but it's just the two of us. There you go. I can live with that. So many questions here. I'm not going to get through them all again. Sadly about that. Sorry about that. Um, Hugo Robot. The hybrid thing began by regulation, not as an innovation. Yeah, that's right. It was a, it was a Jean Todd thing to make Formula One more expensive because he was very annoyed with the whole being hung out to dry in Bahrain business. So that's when he and Bernie went into their we're not talking mode. So let's change the engine regulations, do something good for the sport, hybrid, we'll treble the cost overnight, then they can handle that themselves. Um, super Super 23, I'm not sure I should say this really because it's not very nice. The best thing Haas could have done but done was get rid of Steiner. Well, I know I've got a lot of time for Gunter. Very good carbon guy, nice carbon shop in, in uh, North Carolina. And he's a good racing man, always a laugh. I have a coffee with him in the Summit coffee shop in Charlotte. Mega guy. Um, and I got a lot of time for the fact that he was stood with um, Fittipaldi. Uh, I've forgotten his first name now, anyway. Um, who is uh, their third driver, I think, reserve driver. And that's good. He just met him in the coffee shop and likes him. And he's a good driver, good man. So that's nice. Uh, V10s with biofuels. Uh, yeah, not sure. Oh, that's what you want. That's your engine regulation thing. Okay, yours would be V10s with biofuels. Okay, yeah, it makes a bit of sense. Paddy Low, zero petroleum. I'm interested to actually see some p zero petroleum. I wonder if you can drink it and what it smells like. Interesting to know. Um, so, uh, lots of Joss stuff going on here. I'm just breezing through it all. Um, Kevin Bodman says, when will the powers that be, by which I mean, well, it could be anybody, really. It could be the teams, the FIA, Liberty, uh, throw away all the rules regarding the entire car and let the best teams win. <laughs> well, they are letting the best teams win, aren't they? I think the best team is Red Bull right now, is it not? In terms of technology and Adrian's team. They are winning, but yeah. Um, Alex Cheetah says, nine times out of 10, Formula One teams would choose turbo power over normally aspirated. Well, yeah, not always. I mean, there that, that regulation, which permitted the use of turbochargers in Formula One, came in in 1966. And it wasn't until 1977, what, 11 years later, that a team actually went out and did a turbo. So they went 11 years saying, nah, nah, I don't want turbos. And now they do. James Bryant, Hulkenberg with another impressive qualifying lap. Do you think there's any anything about him as a driver to explain why he's never had a podium? Or is it more just bad luck with teams? Has he never had a podium? Wow, I'm amazed by that. I suppose I should have known that. I just assumed that he would have by now. Um, he's had a pole, is not he, as well? Yeah, and that uh, Brazilian Grand Prix when he's at Williams. Hulkenberg, yeah, no, it's just pure luck. He's never really been with a consistently fast, good team for a long enough period to sort of, I mean, Sergio Perez was with Force India long enough to get the win when the win was finally out there, whereas Nico was never with the team long enough for that. And, I, you know, I love to see him get a podium for sure you know he's a very very quick driver in every respect as is Kevin Magnussen as I said I think Hulkenberg and Magnussen is one of the best driver combinations in Formula One I think they probably get on quite well because they're both at sort of that stage of their career and they're both uh, both hunting for a win obviously I don't think I'll get that far but I think it's a great team and that's one of the reasons the main reason actually, I actually have a lot of interest in where how Haas are going to go this year. I think they'll be really good, as we've seen already in, in Bahrain, as predicted. 
Super 23 says V10s with hydrogen. Uh, I don't know. Get into the hydrogen argument now. It's Toyota, I think, they're already into hydrogen engines. Is that right? Road cars? Easier to crank up the boost. Um, yesterday, it says GDK, a friend of mine was at the cart track and some guys with their electric carts were charging them with a huge diesel generator. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. I love it. Uh, the cynicism of racing people. Wonderful, isn't it? Should, we, should, should Mercedes, this is from Riegfer, should Mercedes be allowed to cheat their engine and PU again another eight years of domination? Uh, I'm quite sure. All the words are run together, so I can't read it. I don't think they're not cheating, are they? Uh, well, you want them to be allowed to cheat so they can get the, the other wins in there. Um, no, I don't think they should be allowed to cheat at all. No, we don't want cheating. Come on. What do you think about Max going to Merck? Well, you know, he, as I said before, I think he'll stay wherever Adrian Newey is. I think he's that bright. I like to think he's that bright anyway. Um, if Adrian announces tomorrow I'm leaving Formula One, I don't want anything more to do with this blasted sport, and I'm going to go and gardening. Um, Sorry, Max. Ciao. I think Max then might consider going to Mercedes in that he, you know, he's been with Red Bull for quite a long time and they're a sort of family company, if you like. And Mercedes is a big car company and he can be a Mercedes guy, you know, if there's no Adrian. But as long as Adrian's there, I think he'll always be at Red Bull. Michael Osogwin says, honestly, I'm still fuming that Andretti got rejected. This sport is so stagnant. Yeah. Well, I, you know, and I feel and I've expressed everything I hopefully that as well as I can about the whole Andretti thing. I think it's an absolute disgrace. But I also think it's very sad that the great Formula Two teams are not ever given the opportunity to be, evolve into being Formula One teams. I know Ollie Oakes is doing all he can to make high tech a Grand Prix team of the future, and I wish him well, and I really hope he does succeed in that. But he's not the only guy there who does a really good job in Formula Two or Formula Three for that matter. And 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 it's just like, no, stay where you are, other side of the fence, go away. And there's so many good people, and, and yeah, a lot of them migrate through the fence into Formula One. But the actual team people that put the money up and put their risk it and start those teams should be given an opportunity i think every few years few years to maybe come into formula one in some form or another david joe Clotz, hello mr windsor today being jim clark's birthday and in my view the greatest driver of all which race do you consider to be his greatest and why thanks love the show is it his birthday well happy birthday jim happy birthday jim uh i've got two copies of jim clark at the wheel here one second And um, there we go, my hardcover version, which Jimmy signed for me at Warwick Farm in 65. And so, yeah, I remember, what can I say? I mean, I never, Jimmy's always in my mind, really. Every day of my life has been. And what was his greatest sh race? 65 British Grand Prix wasn't bad. That he won that pressure from Graham Hill in the closing laps. But much more importantly, Jimmy's Climax engine was very low on oil pressure in the closing laps. And, and Colin Chapman thought there was no way that car was going to finish. And Jimmy came up with the, the novel solution of switching off the engine through Stowe and Club, the highest speed corners, so that the, um, the bearings wouldn't run. And then he would just sort of declutch and the, start the engine again coming out of those quick corners. And I've looked at Autocourse, his lap times. They dropped by a second or something on those laps. And they kept the engine going and won the race. <laughs> Unbelievable. So he's going through Stowe and Club in neutral, effectively, the engine not running. Um, and still won the race. 63 French Grand Prix when he was down on power. But brilliant opening lap. And then when the rain came, he just pulled away at Reims, uh, fabulous drive. 67 Italian Grand Prix, made a pit stop for a place of punctured tire, regained the entire lap on a Monza slipstreaming circuit and was leading, got back to the front of the race, but because he had, had to drive so hard, used too much fuel and ran out of fuel on the last lap. Uh, I don't know, I mean, so many, so many great drives with Jim. I saw him one of his greatest drives, 65 Warwick Farm International 100, lost third gear on his second lap, came past the pits, 
with he doing that three holding three as he went past to showing that to Ray Parsons Ray thought it was a sort of v sign or something but then saw it was three fingers and and then noticed that he's going from second to fourth and and and, and Jimmy was under pressure then again from Graham Hill in a Scuderia Veloce Brabham but then learnt to drive the car without third gear around Warwick Farm which is a pretty twist, twisty circuit where you use third I think for at least 40% of the lap and he still won the race of course as a young kid I didn't really know about the loss of third gear I was watching down at the hairpin and I couldn't really tell that he was going from fourth to second instead of fourth third second on his downshifting and he won the race and I was there on the track jumping the fence cheering him afterwards so there we go JT says that was a F1 statement not the FIA well I have to disagree with you there and tell you that I actually have in front of me the press release from the FIA and it's called FIA media service Andretti application rejected and the whole thing is written by the FIA on FIA note paper so there you go Bahabish Singal. Hey Peter, with everything happening at Alpine, could you see the Renault could we see Renault leave the sport completely and cash out while the team values are higher than they've ever been? Well, yeah, I mean this is along the lines of that question. Could Andretti buy Alpine? I mean, obviously they could. I mean the question is which is the oh, there's a blue super chat there. I better just answer that one next. Um what is the best team for them to buy if that was the only way they could come into Formula One. I'm not sure if Alpine are in this much trouble that Alpine would be the right team to buy. Uh, maybe maybe the second Red Bull team, maybe Visa Cash App would be the best team or maybe Haas. If, you, if they bought that Haas thing and they bought the ability to have Dallara build the car for them and they went to work now with Cadillac and everything else doing a 26 engine that would be quite a cool operation would it not if it had a lot more money behind it especially if they bought that Delara concept I still think having Delara design your car is amazing in a sport where you have to design and build your own car but anyway um, that would be the one I'd go for so Sujith super chat Visa RB might rebrand as Ford Performance in 2026 yeah they might Ford are um, of course doing the power plant with Red Bull from 26 onwards instead of Honda and uh, I know Christian Horner has a bigger role in his current situation anyway um, with that second team so he may be thinking yeah not a really good way of keeping Ford happy and um, feeling as if they're getting good value from the whole thing is to rebrand that team around them so that would be a good thing BW in NJ New Jersey Alonso realistically has two years left, Max. Oh, he's talking to Max, not me. But um, realistically, two years? Uh, go on forever, couldn't he? Um, and then W BW and NJ would have preferred the yearly Max Verstappen Memorial Race at Silverstone. I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Um, Vettel to come back and take that spot beyond TV. Mm, I doubt that. Well... I'm sure he might quite like that, but would. Oh, I mean, I think Lance Stroll might like to have Vettel back again. He seemed to have a better job. He seemed to be uh, more able to beat Vettel than he could Alonso. So from Lance's point of view, he'd probably like to have Vettel back. Um, oh, a lot of people are saying everybody needs to start cheating in order to beat Red Bull. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, Ever Alexis... Gillis. Hi Peter, what do you think about Red Bull in the hands of Perez? I think it isn't dominating the rest, at least not not as it is in the hands of Verstappen. Well, that's right. And if you if, if Max had yeah, I shouldn't say this, but it had a problem on the line and not got away, Sergio Perez would have won the Bahrain Grand Prix, but it would have been close and everyone would be saying, Wow, great season ahead. So that's how that's how fragile it is, Formula One. You know, it's we only have one race. It, something could easily go Max isn't going to win every race that's for sure he's going to have things go wrong so we always have to keep an open mind about that and I think um, Perez is quite capable of winning Grand Prix when Max is not uh, when Max has a bad day or something goes wrong and we shouldn't that you know Max has got a good second driver in the other car there for sure delivery driver says MotoGP is real actual racing compared with other Formula One like series yeah but 
as LJK Setrat said, another of the great British journalists, sadly no longer with us, the problem with MotoGP bikes in general is that, okay, you can, they can lean over at more than 45 degrees to the road, but not much more. And so long as it's that, it's only 1G. So please, you know, move on. Formula One is a completely different stratosphere. And you either want lots of close racing, in which case settle down and watch your NASCAR every Sunday night or British Touring Car Championship or GP3 or F2, or you like the epitome of the sport and the ultimate in technology and all the other stuff that Formula One brings and you watch Formula One. You don't watch Formula One. Well, I don't watch Formula One because I want a close race. I quite enjoy it if there is one on a decent circuit. I don't really enjoy close racing on banal three DRS zone drag strip circuits, but if it's a proper race on a proper racetrack. Yeah, that's good fun. Equally, I like seeing a team do what it does incredibly well in very difficult circumstances. No win is ever easy. Um, so Jean-Baptiste says, Gay was impressed, Jean-Baptiste Gay, sorry, I was impressed by the quote of Alan Prost after the Grand Prix about the RB20 on French television. It's a piece of jewelry just by looking at the car. Which car can come close to Red Bull in that aspect? Well, I mean, I think all of Adrian Newey's cars, and trying to be a little bit serious, are pieces of jewellery. If you look at the detail, if I think back to the first first Newey car I could ever look at in detail, it was the Williams FW14A, the act, the, the passive car before the, the B, and it was a piece of jewellery, and it was everything was microscopically uh, detailed in every respect, even back in 1991. And... That is the hallmark of Adrian's, a little bit like John Barnard, but a little bit, you know, even taking it to a much further degree, I think, and in every aspect of the car. And, and, Ad and practicality as well was, was not good on the Barnard cars. It wasn't actually great, if I think about it, on the Adrian car. I mean, that 14A actually, I think most of the, I was team manager at that point, and the boys, the mechanics, when they got hold of that car, were completely blown away by the incredibly small margins that Adrian had designed into the back of the car, particularly in the way the bodywork fitted around the suspension and the rear rear hubs and the uh, and everything else on the car, and and they we had a lot of all nighters you know, early in the season, just getting bits that would come out from the factory at the last minute, getting them to fit the way Adrian wanted them fitted, because nothing was actually that precise, and we weren't, you know, we it was long before the days of. Um, 3D printing or anything like that and and it was a very I remember the boys on a Monday after a Grand Prix with that 14A were absolutely shattered and my job as team manager was to make sure they got on the flight because they just all missed their wake up calls and that was the deep that was all Adrian's detail and, and of course he was a hard taskmaster and and we had to go for it and he was totally correct you know every little bump mattered to him in terms of the aerodynamics so jewelry yes absolutely beautiful but his road car's pretty good too isn't it i mean when you look at that that valkyrie it's just amazing um jason mcleod could we see seb vettel replacing lewis i can't see it if they've got george they want somebody not that i mean george is super quick but they're going to need somebody quick in the other car aren't they really quick what, I mean, they might as well take Daniel Ricciardo if you're going to take Seb Vettel. Well, that's the sort of pace he is. And I just, Mercedes will want somebody really quick, I think, won't they? Um, so there we go. Um, Amal Singhal says, does budget cap disincentivize employees from working harder? Can they get bonuses if the team wins? Why would they work harder? I think they still get their bonuses. I'm sure that's built into all the budgets. I'd be surprised if any team doesn't have a bonus for the entire factory and race team staff still if you score points and or win a race. 
I mean, you do what you do within the budget cap, and I'm sure that's one of the things you just take for granted with any race team, I would imagine. Unless all the team owners, without my knowing it, have got together and said, ah, oh, let's stop all these bonuses. I don't think even that would work, because even one of them would say, ah, oh, they're, <coughs> they're not offering bonuses. We will, and we'll get all the top guys. <coughs> Excuse me, all this coughing's not very good, is it? <coughs> for a live stream. Anyway, I haven't got much long. I'm over time already. My wife's already showing me the watch. Johnny Herbert. Johnny Herbert to drive for Mercedes? Uh, or Johnny Herbert as a commentator? Yeah, good man. Good kart racer too. Um, if the cars, this is from Webb Henke, if the cars have a 50% electric drive, will the cars be even bigger because of even bigger batteries? Well, I think they're trying to do a lot to reduce the sizes. And there's certainly a move within the FIA driven by the teams to try to reduce the size and weight of the Formula One cars going forward. It's all a bit wishy-washy because every time they try to improve safety, it puts on weight. And every time there's an incident and they can learn from it, usually a change is made to the regulation that does put, put on weight. So, um, so there we go. So a lot of chat amongst themselves, as often happens at the end of these live streams. Um, so uh, Carolina says, question, what are you making of a rumor stating Verstappen to Merck in 25? Well, I think, um, wouldn't, isn't that what Toto would like everyone to think might be possible? And as I said, my what I what I what do I make of that? I make of that that Max is not stupid, and Max knows that so long as Adrian Newey is at Red Bull, that's where he's going to race. I can't imagine Max would think, "Oh yeah, I'm sick of Red Bull because Adrian's off the boil. I need a need a new challenge." <laughs> I just can't imagine he's that he would do that. He's a racer; he wants to win. That's my reaction to it. David Brown. I wonder if that's the David Brown. Anyway, if it is, hi David. Uh, thoughts on Paddy Lowe and his fuel. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? He's at um, that fuel is now associated with the Sauber F1 team, which is going to become the Audi Formula One team. And we also already have at Audi a really good guy from the Williams days of the 14A and the 14B, John Sutton, doing all the drivetrain there. So you've got two major players from the Williams 14A and 14B at Audi now. What do you make of that? I think that's quite impressive. Um, Paddy's there, obviously, in his role of um, founder and founder of Zero Petroleum. And I, I, I WhatsApped him uh, in Bahrain to congratulate him on his deal. And he said, yeah, yeah, let's do this. I'll come on the show soon and explain everything. So watch this space. Um, Johnny Rotten <laughs> says, kill electric, give us V10s on biofuel. Yeah, well, that's not going to happen, I think. Um, so more questions. Noah, hi, Peter. If you were to make a list of most naturally talented Grand Prix drivers, where would you rank Jim Clark, Michael Schumacher and Max Verstappen? Um, oh, uh, very, very highly amongst Tatsio Nubilari, Sterling Moss, Juan Manuel Fangio, uh, all the great drivers, Mario Andretti, um, Nicky. Um, so... Um, Actually, I just had a WhatsApp from the, from John Sutton saying, I'm currently not watching your show. I'm watching an hour-long interview of Nigel Mansell by Jody Kidd, Jody Kidd the model. Very interesting. <laughs> okay. Thanks, John. Um, <laughs> this is quite funny, isn't it? The um, <clears throat> What was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Another, another one I've had. Interesting one, this. I'm not going to give his name away because he's asked me never to publicize all these details. But uh, where, where is he now? Um, He's, this is a mate of mine that does, he's one of these guys that does all these stats about um, great drivers taking into account the era, the car they drove, everything else, blah, blah, blah. And he's got all these factors in to mitigate against being in a bad car or being in the wrong era. And um, let's just see what he's got as his top five, right? Number one, this is, and he's done a lot of research on this based on all the cars they drove, the era in which they drove, and their success in those eras. 
the number one driver of all time, according to my friend, Jim Clark. That's why I'm telling you this. Second, Ayrton Senna. Third, one Manuel Fangio. Fourth, Lewis Hamilton. Fifth, Michael Schumacher. Sixth, Tazio Nuvolari. Seventh, Sebastian Lo Loeb. Wow, mega, because he's bringing rally drivers into this. And I've always said Sebastian Loeb was good. Mario Andretti, eighth. Alberto Ascari, ninth. What would Mario think of that? Bearing in mind his childhood hero was Alberto Ascari. And 10th, Sterling Moss. It's this really good list, isn't it? I'm going to go on here. 11, Sebastian Vettel. Interesting. 12, Jackie Stewart. Now, I would have put Stewart ahead of Vettel. 13, AJ Foyt. Yeah, I go with that. 14, Tom Christensen. Uh, Tom, I really rate, but I mean, I wouldn't put him ahead of... Juan Pablo Montoya, who's 15th, or Alan Prost, who's 16th, or Graham Hill, who's 17th, or Nigel Mansell, especially, who's 18th, Nicky, 19, Jack Brabham, 20, Emerson, 21, Ix, 22, Scott Dixon, 23, Dan Gurney, 24, Richard Petty, 25. <laughs> Brilliant. Imagine if these people all came back to life. This, is, this was the grid. 26, John Surtees, Jeff Gordon, Mark Donahue, Dale Earnhardt, uh, Dale Earnhardt, Sr., I guess it's senior. Sebastian Ogier, interesting. Max Verstappen, way down there, that's interesting. Based on, I guess, having a dominant car, I guess, rather than having to drive, win with a bad car. I, I don't know. I'm not going to drop him in it, so you don't know his name anyway. Jimmy Johnson, Pedro Rodriguez. Good to see Pedro up there, Mega. Mika Hakkinen, ahead of Mika Hakkinen. Derek Bell, Dario Franchitti, 36th. Wow, what a list of drivers. I can think of a million more that should be in there, of course. I see Bernd Rosemeyer's not there. I see Achille Vazzi's not there. Um, wow. Yeah, good. Anyway, we can talk about those things for days and days and days, can't you? Uh, Super 2323. Is this a great way to end the live stream with this point? Whatever Mr. Newey is getting paid, it isn't enough. Yeah, I think it probably is. I can possibly even better that with a Dan Gurney quote once. You may have heard this. Apologies if you had. But I was interviewing him for for Speed uh, Speed Vision, actually, and one of the early Goodwoods, Goodwood Festival. And when I was working with Alan Decadney, happy days. And I said to Dan, what do you think about Adrian Newey's designs? And Dan looked at me and said, um, in my next life, I'd like to be a particle of air split by a wing designed by Adrian Newey. <laughs> I thought, yes, Daniel Sexton Gurney, who, of course, created the Gurney flap, so he knows a lot about wings. Anyway, I'm going to have to wind it up, guys and girls. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you very much indeed for your support, for your comments, for your questions. It's a lot of fun always, and uh, we're going to do many more. Don't, don't worry. It's just that it's a bit hectic at the moment, isn't it? Races every weekend. We'll try and do another one straight after Saudi Arabia. I'll be doing the same videos as well on Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. Kind of nice that Saturday race, wasn't it? W worked well for me with the golf tournament on Sunday anyway, so that was good. And um, But nice anyway. You know, spend a bit of time with the family or whatever you do on a Sunday. Watch the footy. And uh, let's bring some more. That won't happen. It's all because of Ramadan, isn't it? But anyway, there we go. Um, so thanks to Jetcraft. Thanks to Pitbox. Without whom, this channel wouldn't be what it is. <laughs> I won't go into what it is. Uh, hopefully, it's something that you enjoy. And we'll enjoy again in the future, in the very, very um, near future. Thanks for watching. And see you again very soon. He says, looking for the close. There we go. <laughs>